Okay, so I just hit the record just so that you all know we do record our meetings and then we put place it on our uh, Facebook and our YouTube. Welcome everybody. It is Thursday, April 27th and we're starting our meeting. We're calling our meeting to order at 7.06 p.m. Welcome everyone. Um, and so today we have a packed agenda. I hope you all received it. We are um, welcome all and we will start with our public gallery sessions. Just so that everybody knows, you have three minutes in total, two and a half minutes to um, share, and then 30 seconds so that we can um, come up with next steps. Okay, do we have anybody that would like to speak? Raise your hand for the public agenda. Okay, Ms. Granby. Good evening, everyone, uh, for the public agenda. Uh, Granby's Funeral Services has been in this community as of today, 39 years. Therefore, it is not, we are not new to improvements or changes in our community. In the areas of community board number 12, a safer and better implementation of the bike lanes would have been better on Barnes Avenue rather than White Plains Road. No one in this meeting can object to cleaner environment for all of us. However, we do need to be smarter and not work harder. Right now, we are working harder. The implementation of these bike lanes is causing multiple restrictions to our community. One, in regards to the safety of our community, because EMS, fire, police are not able to pass on White Plains Road like they used to. We cannot have cars pulling to the right so that they can pass because there is no right for them to pull to. And if you notice, if you ever drive around community board number 12, community board number 12 is even the worst part of the whole strip because there is, you have the uh, EMS vehicles, you have the school vehicles, and you have people who are trying to learn how to park. Now, when I say that, I say all of us, when we all learn to drive and uh, get our license, we all had to learn how to par parallel park on a curb, not the way it is right now. So right now it's a devil catch can and it's showing truly that a lot of people do, do not know how to park. Also, with this implementation of the bike lane, it is definitely making an economic impact on our community because you are not able to pull up park your car and go to a merchant because there is no rhyme or reason of how to park. Each block on White Plains Road has a different method of how people are parking and it truly shows that people do not know how to park, let alone how they pull out of those spaces when they are parking. The merchants who are very accustomed to people parking, buying their goods, then leaving parking, buying their goods, and leaving are not getting the traffic that they used to. Now, to say, oh, they should be getting foot traffic, there is no foot traffic because the people can't park their cars anywhere to get out of their cars and get to the merchants. Also, I think it, in regards to the whole sustainability of the community, we should have been in, really engaged. We were not engaged as merchants. We were not really engaged as a community. Uh, this decision to have these bike lanes is a bad decision. We need to go to real real working solutions. Like I said, having the bike lane on Barnes you Avenue would be safer. For, you have five safer, seconds left. Would be safer. And I thank you for my time. Thank you for sharing, Ms. Granby. Next up, we have Mary. Yes, um, I was at your meeting one year ago, April 28th, 2022. Uh, when you approve the bike lanes, uh, and, uh, I was talking about something else, a smoke shop, and you helped me with that. But there was one person who spoke about the bike lanes. And what he said was, my concern is that it seems like we're favoring bikes. And on White Plains Road, that seems to be not working with the amount of businesses on White Plains Road. I don't know how this got approved. And maybe I wasn't at the meeting or our residents weren't at the meeting, but it seems very weird that the bike agenda seems to be so strong. And I don't see the amount of bicycles that are needed to make such a drastic change in the streets on my Plains Road. Now, at that meeting, um, there was a lot of discussion about trucks uh, parked near Avenue and the district manager, and I believe Councilman Dinowitz 
both of whom I respect, said, well, we have to think of our constituents. Uh, we have to think of our constituents. Uh, a lot of the truckers live in the neighborhood. Well, I ask, why not think of your constituents when they're the businesses? Uh, the businesses pay a lot of taxes. We should be considered too. And why allow the city to experiment on White Plains Road? Uh, Mr. Torres said that we were the first. Why allow us to be the first? I believe that the board was manipulated by the Department of Transportation and the city. And the fact that there was inadequate notice is related to that. And, you know, at the meeting, you approved on the condition that there be no bike lanes on the sidewalk. But there are lines on the sidewalk for bike lanes. So I just ask that, you know, you consider us, you spread the word to other community boards that they have to solicit input. I think everyone knows this is a disaster. If we're gonna be honest, if you go to White Plains Road, you drive down the street, it is horrendous. Uh, it's one lane traffic and it's very narrow uh, for uh, e e over and over again. I drove down the other day and in three blocks, I had to stop and go over to the lane three times. One was a police car that couldn't pull over. The other was a garbage truck that couldn't pull over. So now they can't pull over. We're just It's not a work for, meeting. Um, for both. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mary. Next up, we have Joan Angel. Okay. Number one with Mary and Mrs. Gramby said is actually true. But there is so uh, there's a very bad problem with deliveries and the safety of this because they have to deliver in the middle of the street and stuff. And we have to send people out to keep an eye on them. We had a delivery today. The guy was on 239th Street and we were in the middle of 238th Street. We had to go down and get the eye. And he was afraid to park in the middle of the block because he was afraid of unloading he could get hit. Said, there is no safety feature with this and stuff like that you you're absolutely putting the bikes before businesses and then we're getting out of the cars in the middle of the l where things are falling off it and forget what it does to the cars that's another subject oh, I mean, it's not a something that was well thought out it was something that was pushed through by somebody and it should be reevaluated. and the the businesses are a lot more important then there's not enough bike traffic on White Plains Road to warrant all this stuff like that. And in effect, half of the businesses are losing their shirts and stuff. They can't get deliveries. They can't do anything. And they lose half of their customers. Thank you. Thank you, Joan Angel. Next up, we have Sue Peters. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I want to bring up another issue uh, to start to educate your board about um, the mayor's office of technology uh, is now putting into all five boroughs on the sidewalks, 32 feet cell towers with five antennas at the top of them. Many, many Community boards are speaking out, passing resolutions against this. Uh, and I just want to tell people, you need to do your own reading and thinking about this because the mayor's office of technology is not giving all the information out when they do their presentations. And I, I just will say this. Um, they will not share the expected radiation levels emanating from these jumbo cell towers 10 feet from where people live. They're right on the sidewalks. If you live in a third story apartment building and you have 10 feet outside your window, this jumbo antenna, no. You will be radiating yourself and your family constantly 24 7. Um, OTI will tell you they're safe. 
Do not believe them. Do your own research. And for one thing, they say um, the FCC, which is the agency in Washington that oversees these cell towers, federal agency, the FCC has guidelines that says above this guideline, uh, it's not safe. Below this guideline, it's safe. That guideline was set in 1996 by the FCC and they refused to change it even though in 1996 there were not that many cell cell phones with people having it up against their ear now there's hundreds of millions of cell phones and they refuse to 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 look at 11,000 pages of studies that prove health effects deleterious health effects well i'm sorry the guideline your time is up but this is an important matter can you make sure that you connect with carla and we can bring this up in committee for yes. it on our environmental because we should pay more attention to this but we let's bring that up in committee so if okay. you don't mind is, connecting with carla is carla the, the district manager she's the chair i'm the district no the district manager is george but carla is the chair of the environmental committee oh great so we can thank you so there. much Put Thank that you. in the chat. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Next up, we have. Hold on. Q. Hey. Good evening, everyone. Hope all is well. Um, just to piggyback off of what uh, Miss Peter said, uh, there is a lot of times that information is given to us and it's not transparent. And, um, you know, to piggyback off of what Mary said, I do feel that, you know, um, the Department of Transportation has uh, manipulated a uh, certain type of information when given to the community board and that, you know, we as people who uh, own properties and pay taxes, we have zero equity in any form of decision making. You know, I'm a practical person and I put the community first. I've done breast cancer, no, money for breast cancer, coat drives, food drives, um, toy drives, out of my own money, financial literacy events. I've literally spent over $250,000 in this community because I love and I care about this community. Sometimes, you know, John may say something I may not agree with. Mr. Alfredo may say something I may not agree with, but I do know that they care about this community. You know, and I just feel that there are certain individuals on the community board who, who don't care about the community, you know, in terms of the bus lanes on Gun Hill Road, that's going to be a disaster. That's there's so much parking that's going to be reappropriated um, and that's going to be an issue. And the Department of Transportation hasn't considered any of our concerns. They wanted to bring up Pelham Parkway. Pelham Parkway in one direction is literally wider than Gun Hill Road in all directions. Pelham Parkway has a lot of parks, a lot of residential and they still have side parking. So there's so many things with the bike lanes, with the bus lanes that don't make sense and the quality of living really isn't there. And it's really disappointing that we have people that really love and care about this community and that try and that give back. And it's like we're, we're facing this because, you know, we don't have one voice to literally, you know, step up and speak, you know, to to the government. So I hope something can be done. Um, and thank you for my time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Q. Uh, we appreciate your participation. And just to remind everybody, right, like the full board meeting, the public gallery really doesn't allow us the full potential to talk about these issues. We invite you to come to our committees, right? That's where impact can be made. And numbers matter. And so if we really want to make an impact, we implore you all, bring your folks, bring the local residents, come to committee, that's when we can have these discussions at large. So thank you so much. Um, Odette Wilkins. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for having me. I'm president and general counsel of Wired Broadband. I'm located in Queens, New York City. And uh, we are focused, we are a nonprofit focusing on safe technology for the public. So I just want to um, build up, build on what Sue Peters was talking about. And that is that uh, with respect to link 5G towers, the city has no information about what kinds of antennas are going to be used, what the power 
of the antennas are. And of course, you know, we'll go, I, I would be happy to talk about this at the Committee on Environment, but I just want to give you an overview that there has been no transparency and we have had FOILs submitted to OTI since November of 2021, which have, have either gone unanswered or they say they don't have the information. Now, how do you have, how do you deploy 7,500 towers in a potential of 7,500 cell towers in New York City without knowing what antennas you're using, what the power potential is, and what the cumulative exposure of all of these antennas are going to be. Now, there's been a recent development. The Federal Communications Commission just notified City Bridge, which is a site developer constructing these cell towers, that they are in violation of federal law. Now, OTI has been saying that they're in compliance in, with federal law. They are not. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission has not ruled out enforcement actions against City Bridge. They were supposed to have engaged in environmental review and review of the historical preservation um, aspects of the potential sites for these towers and for each antenna. They did not do that. And so they have constructed these and these towers without the appropriate review. So the FCC has given, they, they are on notice now, and the FCC has not um, ruled out enforcement actions against City Bridge. Mm -hmm. So not only is there no transparency, there's lack of compliance with federal law, which puts them in material breach of their representations and warranties in the franchise agreement with New York City. It puts them in breach with their covenants from the franchise agreement with New York City. And at this point, we really need to break this wide open mm -hmm. and to really re-examine the entirety of this program and there's there has not been um meaningful community input on this and the public design commission tasked oti to go around to the community boards to find out what the community input is with respect to the design and the provisioning of services and and other factors um, but OTI has only been asking for where do you want to cite them? Well, that's not the directive that PD PDC gave them. This is supposed to be a pilot program of 200 uh, towers. Okay, three minutes are up. But again, I also invite you. Can you please connect with Carla? This is something that we should speak more in depth in committee. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Does anyone else, um, anyone else for public gallery? Yes, please. Your name? My name is Jemima Osafo. I'm a social work student at Lehman College and currently working, um, doing my internship at Rain Senior Older Adult at Gang Hill Road. You sound muffled. You're cutting up a bit. I'm from Lehman College, a student of, at Lehman College and currently doing my internship at Rain Gang Hill Road. I wanted to share some of the services that we provide at our Older Adult Center. So RAIN offers services for individuals who are above 80 years and, and 65. We offer transportation systems to older adults who, who are available to community 9, 10, 11, and 12. And members who qualify for this are people who have Medicare only. We also offer home health aid, deliver, home delivery meal, which help maintain the nutritional health for home bound older adults and and also continue a quality life for them. We also have low income housing for older adults. We provide low income for older adults with the option that allow them to live independently. We also have um case management, which our case management managers link older adults to a various essential services such as transportation, health care services, and others. We, at my center where I am, which is 3377 White Place Road, we have activities at the, at the older adult center, such as karaoke, Zumba, daily exercises, computer classes, which is every Tuesday at 9 to 10.45, we have also nutritional classes where alliances nutritionists give over tip and a quality health life for the older adults. We also have a trip for the older adults who are at the center every twice a month. Um, they, we organize a trip for them, which they only pay for $5 and they go to places like Christmas tree, 
or Walmart. We also have Zumba classes. We have karaoke. We have um, home health aid services for older adults who, who qualify for them. Our numbers for the home health aid services are 347. If you could put that in the chat. Okay, I'm going to do that. Put Thank all the you. information in the chat because you sound staticky, so we didn't get it all, okay? Make sure you put okay. it in the chat. Thank you. Virginia? Yes, uh, I had a meeting with the Wakefield taxpayers and the meeting consists of uh, the water board. And we was told that we need to speak to someone from the environmental area about these uh, problems in the ground for three different areas that they have something going on in the ground, the chemicals. I don't know if anybody's aware of what's going on there that they have some chemicals in the ground in our neighborhood. And uh, I was told that the water board that was our guest speaker was not the right person. So I want to actually make you all aware of what's going on. I don't know if you all know about these chemicals that's going on in our neighborhood that's supposed to be not so good for us. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Carla, who's the chair of environmental um, committee, she's here. Carla, if you could follow up with her on that, that would be great. Yeah, land use should be in on this too. Okay. So Carla, if you can gather um, maybe Virginia's information, you wanna say something? Uh, yeah, we both, uh, Carla and I will both um, be in touch with um, Ms. Sanders. I, we'll follow up. Wonderful, thank you. Anyone else before we, before we move on to the next item on our agenda? Yes, hi, my name is Serena Etting. Hello. Hi, Serena. Hi, how are you? Yes, I own property over in the Northeast Bronx on Fish Avenue. And, you know, I, along with Q, you know, went around trying to get um, signatures to try to remove the uh, bus lanes, I mean, the, um, the uh, bike lanes for on, underneath White Plains Road under the L. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we actually have something done about this. Um, I'm also learning through Q that they're placing um, the bike lanes on Gun Hill Road. And the traffic that is on Gun Hill Road is insane right now. If you do this, or when it's the done, it's going, going to be far Hill. worse. Where'd she get this from? Say it again. There are no bike lanes going on Gun Hill Road. Well, what is it that there's? They're putting an express bus lane on bike on Gun, and they're not taking any of the parking. No, the bus lanes. The bus lanes. Sorry. Bus lane. Correct. The bus lane is not the going bus to mess lanes with that the, are going. That's right now. There's people double park on Gun Hill Road, which and mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you. Find out when is a transportation meeting and then come to the transportation meeting, like our chair said, and we could discuss this issue at the transportation meeting. All right. So as but I, we wanted to know, like, how is it that this is all done without the community actually voting on community, it? The community knows about it. And Q was at the last meeting. Ask Q. You speak to No, him. but we heard we heard about it after the fact. But it's not done yet. They're actually working on it. Yeah, but we don't want it to be done. That's the thing. No. <laughs> so what he's saying is, why don't We're we all rally? It. Why don't we all rally at the committee meeting, right? And so we've yep. we, we've been mentioning for the past three months. Um, what was your name again? Serena Atten. Serena, have you been to our committee meetings? Yeah, I've been. I've been before, like when I had issues with my tenants and I had. But have you been to the home. past? past three meetings that we've had where we've been having these discussions. I, I missed the last one, but I was okay. there about so, maybe a month so we or want two you to. We want to make sure that you're joining again, right? Like we are only 38 board members, right? We need you all there to be more impactful. And so the, we keep saying this, come to our committee meetings, let's plan, let's strategize, but we can't do this on our own. We do need your, your support and your push. The best place to have these discussions at large are at our committee mm -hmm. meetings. 
So please put your information in the chat and we'll make sure that you're included in our list. Well, I'm on the phone, so how do I, I I'm not able to put my information in the chat. In the chat. Um, does Q have your information? Can he put it for you? Yeah, he should be able to. Q, can you put her email in the chat so that we add her to our email list? The more, the more of you that join our committees, the more powerful we are, right? Well, um, we had yeah. a walkthrough when we were doing, uh, having the elected officials for the White Plains Road bike lanes, only a few people showed up. That was the moment where the elected officials, the commissioner was there for everybody to be there. And so again, all we're asking is for your support. Show up. That's how we make an we'll impact. Do. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else before Thank we you. move on? Great. Now we're going on to the third item on the agenda, elected officials reports. Who do we have first? Close the hearing first. This was the public gallery session. So we're, we're closing that item on our agenda. Public gallery session has closed. Now we're moving on to the elected officials reports. Jenna? Yes. Hi, this is Jenna Klaus from Council Member Eric Dinowitz's office. Hi. Thank yeah. you so much for having us tonight. Um, first, I just wanted to let everybody know how to reach us. So by phone, you can reach us at 718-549-7300, or you can email dinowitz at council.nyc.gov. And if you want to see us in person, our office is un under renovation right now, but we're at the assembly member's office on 3107 Kingsbridge Avenue. We're also at libraries across the district. Um, so you can contact us for that information. Um, some events we have coming up, we're working to get a rain barrel event in Woodlawn. Um, that should be sometime in June and we will alert the board before then. Also, I would love for CB12 to be a co-sponsor of our upcoming Local Law 97 webinar. Um, so I'll put my email in the chat so hopefully I can hear from somebody from the board tomorrow and we can get your logo on the flyer. Um, next up for budget, yesterday the mayor presented his executive budget. Um, the council and council member Denowitz as a member of the budget negotiating team are preparing to fight against uh, cuts affecting CUNY, libraries, essential services. So stay tuned for his work on that. We're still working to allocate our own discretionary budget, which has millions of dollars that we give towards programming services, capital improvements. Um, we're taking feedback from the board, from constituents on how you would like to see that money spent. So I'll also put this in the chat. You can fill out our form at ericdenowitz.nyc backslash budget feedback. Um, so we're really hoping um, a lot of people participate in that. Um, just one more thing, the board should have received a legislative update from our office today, but I just wanted to share some highlights from today's stated meeting. So Council Member Dinowitz introduced four resolutions today to enhance the educational experiences of New York City students and to honor the contributions of veterans. Um, he also voted on and co-sponsored a number of bills to promote safety, security, and the dignity of New York uh, communities. And we also voted on resolutions to fully fund the MTA, combat anti-Semitism, and remove bureaucracy in government. Um, so I'm sure if everybody else, if the community is interested in this, I can also share that memo. Um, we put them together every two weeks for stated meetings. And that is it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna. If you can put all that information in the chat, that would be great. Next up, we have Alina. Hi, good evening, everyone. I Hi, see Alina. a lot of friendly faces and then I see some new faces. My name is Alina Dow. I am the Bronx Borough Director for the Mayor's Community Affairs and I cover Community Boards 7 through 12. I just wanted to share a few updates and information. Um, so as we know that the summer is going to be approaching really quickly and uh, while our application process has ended for the summer youth program, we are still looking for businesses 
that can provide opportunities for our children to work at. So please, I'm going to share in the chat a link. If you know any businesses, we don't want our kids to be out there doing nothing. If we have businesses that can provide um, jobs to them with the city paying, then we know that they'll be somewhere and they'll, they won't be getting in trouble. I also wanted to let you know that the mayor is committed to reducing the city's a food base emission by 33% by 2030. And uh, the, um, the mayor also has, um, I'm sure everybody has heard, but he has um, appointed the first ever rat czar. So if you have areas that you think are plagued with um, rats, please send me the information and then I will connect with the rat czar and see if we can get them over there to address that issue. I also wanted to let you know that the city and the mayor has intended to file a lawsuit against Kia and Hyundai for refusing to safeguard the vehicles that have been um, broken into because of the um, the the TikTok. You know, on TikTok, they've been showing these kids how to break into cars and, and, and um, steal them. So the mayor has said that he intends to file a lawsuit against them. He also has announced a tentative contract um, with the with the the B A the P P B A. <laughs> they have reached a tentative contract. Um, the launch of the city rising enrollment portal. It it's open and it's closing on May first. So if you have any young people, young you know little ones that you want to try to get into the summer rising program, I'll also include the chat the link in the chat for you to be able to fill that out. I always tell everybody the mayor wants to give you information directly from himself. So please sign up for his newsletter. He has a podcast as well, and we hope that you guys can stay connected. I will put my information in the chat. If there's other things that you wanted to contact me about, please feel free to contact me. That's about it. Everyone have a good night. Thank you, Alina. Next up, Kiara, welcome. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm trying to put my camera on. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Kira. I'm the new director of community boards of the borough president's office. It's great to see you all. I'm also a resident of community board 12. So I'm really excited to be joining your meetings again. Um, I just have a quick report. We are um, finishing up our reappointment interviews. This is the first year that the borough president has asked that we do reappointment interviews. I have a few people left of community board 12. So please just look out for the emails that I've been sending and schedule a time. And then in addition to that, we are going to be wrapping up interviews for members who are applying to the community board. This year we got 547 applications, which is awesome. And, you know, we thank, we thank the boards for doing community outreach and getting people to apply. So we'll be giving, um, we'll be doing reappointments and new appointments in the near future. I'll put my contact information in the chat should anyone need to reach me. Thank you. Thank you, Kiara. It was great to have you here. Next Thanks. up, Donella. Hello, everyone. My name is Donella from the Office of Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinwitz. Unfortunately, he could not be here tonight. They are still working on the budget. However, just a few updates. Our office is host, we're hosting two shred events in May and June. Um, so one is May 7th and we'll be on West 235th and Johnson Avenue from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And the next one is June 11th and we'll be in front of our office. I will post the dates and the locations in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Cynthia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, awesome. So, hey, good evening, everyone. This is Cynthia from Council Member Kevin Riley's office. Uh, just to go over the few procedurals. So, our we have two offices: one at 940 East Gun Hill Road, in between Bronxwood and Colden Avenue, and the other in Co-op City Section Five at 135 Einstein Loop, Room 44, on the second floor. And just wanted to uh, go over the phone number: 718-684-5509. Email District One Two District Twelve at Council.NYC.gov. And then just going into the events, we've got a good number of events coming up for the spring and summer season. Just wanted to go over the stuff for the end of May and the beginning at the end of April and beginning of May. So this weekend we're going to be co-hosting with the Northeast Bronx YMCA, the Healthy Kids Day Initiative event. This will be from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. this Saturday, April 29th at 1250 East 229th Street. And 
I know the forecast isn't too good right now, but this event will be rain or shine. If it's good weather outside, we'll be outside. If not, we'll be inside the YMCA. Next week, we're also going to be having a Citizens Committee grant info session. Uh, this will be with the Baychester Library. So this will be an opportunity for neighborhood associations, both ones that have a 501c3 status and not, to be able to learn about how to get a, a potential grant from the Citizens Committee for New York City. They have small micro grants to uh, do neighborhood beautification projects and just honestly all sorts of good stuff. And they actually do also have a small business program as well. This event will be May 2nd, 530 to 630 p.m. at 2049 Loop and Co-op City. <laughs> and then May 3rd is definitely a little packed. <laughs> May 3rd, we have a cooking demonstration and nutritional education uh, event at the Bay Eden Senior Center, 1220 East 229th Street. That will be from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, it's going to have a live cooking demonstration, how to just make sure that you're able to prepare healthy foods, healthy options, managing a budget, because honestly, we know it's very tight right now. <laughs> and also, uh, we're going to be partnering with the CB12 Economic Development Committee to co-host an event for small businesses at the CB12 board office. And that will be from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. at 4101 White Plains Road. Um, business owners will be able to learn about how they can contest violations, how they can resolve anything that they may be in the wrong for, and just be able to know their rights and get some resources from uh, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, and to be able to connect with the Economic Development uh, Committee at CB12, and of course our office, <laughs> to find out about these events and more. <laughs> you can visit the link tree linktr ee slash cm Kevin C. Riley. Thank you guys so much for putting up. <laughs> Have a great Thank day. you, Cynthia. Make sure you put and everything in the chat. Lot. <laughs> I put no, it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, next up, we have Renell. Hi, this is Renell from State Senator Jamal T. Bailey's office. So last week we had our annual Taste of the District at the YMCA. Um, so we're now closing out. Um, Taste of the District by having um, specials from April 27th, which um, which is today to, through May 4th. Um, if you're interested in which small businesses are partaking, you can um, provide your email, um, directly email me in the chat, and then I can send out that information. Um, also, we're having a Mother's Day celebration Saturday, May 13th from one to four in Co-op City. If you're interested in that also, um, just state that you are interested in that in the chat and I'll provide the link. Thank you. Thank you, Ronell. Any other representatives from our elected officials? Alexis, are you here? Okay. All right, so I think that concludes our um, elected officials reports. So we will now move on to our special presentation today. We have um, Paul Phillips, who's with the City Planning Office of the Bronx Borough President's Office. As you know, we're really wanting to make sure that we are fully informed. There's a lot of development happening in our district. Many of us aren't familiar with zoning um, laws and codes. And so it's important that we become informed as well as other questions that we may have. Even as a board, although we are advisory, there is an opportunity for us to sometimes have a vision of a development that we would like to see. And so um, Paul will be walking us through how we can potentially make uh, our own vision possible and happen and come to fruition. Thank you, um, Paul. And if you can give us your title and all that, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't capture that. That's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. The floor okay, is perfect. Uh, so my title is uh, Borough Director. Uh, and I'm the borough director here at the Bronx office at the Department of City Planning. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to thank uh, the board, uh, district manager, uh, George Torres and board chair Cornell for the invitation this evening. Um, as, as the board chair mentioned, my name is Paul Phillips. I am the new, well, I guess I'm still new. I've been on the job three months. I will use new until someone tells me I can't um, for the Department of City Planning in the Bronx office. Uh, just a little background for those of you. Um, so I've spent, I've worked for the city for 17 years, and of those 17 years, I've spent 14 of those working here in the Bronx. Um, I worked for the Department of City Planning from 2006 to 2016, and then most recently, I was a district manager at Community Board 4 
here in the Bronx uh, from Jan from 2016 until January of this year. Um, as I mentioned, I've been on the job for a little over three months, and I've been making the rounds to all the Bronx CBs. Uh, let me first start by saying um, I know firsthand how hard um, you all work as volunteers to contribute uh, to the long-term growth and sustainabilities of your neighbor of your neighborhoods. I also have tremendous respect for and admiration for the work that you guys do. Um, having been a DM for nearly seven years, I know the extraordinary responsibilities that you all are tasked with on a daily basis. Uh, land use and zoning being one of the most critical as it has long lasting impacts on your neighborhood. There is no repository or encyclopedia of knowledge that is that is more valuable about a neighborhood uh, than the people that live and work there. Uh, my goal or hope for our office um, is that we can be a resource for all 12 boards across the borough uh, and neighborhoods and uh, the neighborhoods that serve them. Zoning and land use can be complicated and difficult to navigate uh, for the public, especially in New York City. I've been doing this for 17 years and I continue to learn things every single day. Um, so I completely get it and understand. Um, I want to assure you all that the Bronx Office of City Planning is committed to providing you all with the tools and the knowledge necessary to make informed decisions about land use. Uh, we want to be a resource in helping you all understand zoning and land use um, and the city's land use review process. Most importantly, to allow you all to participate in a way that is meaningful and impactful. Uh, I believe in transparency and communication. I cannot promise you that we will always agree and have consensus 100% of the time, but I can promise you that we will operate with intentionality and purpose and listen actively. Um, I look forward to working with, uh, with you all uh, in this new role and continue serving the city of New York and the Boulder Bronx. Uh, tonight, I'm going to walk you through uh, a little bit about zoning uh, at a very high level and then also take you through uh, the city's land use review procedure and then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Okay. Yes, you are. Go ahead. Okay, let me just, let's just see. Okay, hold on. Um, hold on. Okay, what am I doing? Can you wait? Hold on. Can you all? Can you uh, hold on? Can you see my screen? Okay. All right. Let's see. Stop. Okay. Let's go to. Bear with me one second. I don't use WebEx, or we don't use That's WebEx fine. at no, all. No, no. So take your time. We could you see your it. screen, but but you need to get to the. There you go. Okay. So you can see my screen. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Bear with me one okay. second. Let me go to. Let me move that. Let's do that. Sorry. I have too many windows open. All right, let's do that. Now let's do that. Okay. All right. Wait a second. Okay, so if I do share content. All right, there we go. Perfect. I think that should be it. All right, this is okay. Can you what? Yes, can... it's up now. Your you PowerPoint. can see that. We can okay, see perfect. it. Okay, you can see it. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so why can't I see it? Um that this is sorry. No, it's okay. What? You can see the PowerPoint. Well, it was there and it vanished. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, all right, let's try this one more time. Sorry. You had it it's okay. Share content. Okay. Um, share. Okay, there we go. Okay, now, now I, I think I got it the third time's a charm. Let's see. Can you share content? Something's coming up. There it is. And okay. just for everybody, if you need to make it bigger, like right, right above the presentation, there's a, a percentage. Like mine is at 60. If you keep pressing the plus sign, it'll get bigger for you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just change my view. All right. Sorry. I need control. Okay. Oh, God, no. Sorry. You see that present button? Okay, I okay. I think I think I've got it now. I, I apologize. We see it. Go ahead. No worries. All right, perfect. Uh, so just so, so 
just going through uh, the agenda for tonight, for this presentation. So, going to talk a little bit about what we what what we do as an agency, uh, what zoning is about, where does it come from, a little bit of its genesis, uh, zoning today, uh, enforcement and the zoning resolution, some basic concepts and terms, and then uh, why does zoning change. Uh, so, just a little bit about us as an agency. So, our mission as an agency is to foster sustainable growth of complete neighborhoods towards a city that meets the housing, economic, and social needs of all New Yorkers. Um, just in terms of our strategic mission, so focus under uh, five key pillars. The first is support thriving neighborhoods through integ integrated community planning. Uh, the second is to lead citywide planning for housing production, job growth, and livability. The third, plan for a resilient and sustainable city that provides adequate infrastructure for growth. Uh, the fourth, ensure timely and responsive reviews of current planning applications. And we can talk a little bit more about like what that means and how that process works. And then the, uh, the fifth is to supply objective planning data and expertise to a broad range of stakeholders. I'll also just note that that, the, that last piece right there, that includes community boards. So I would encourage folks and we can do something separately. Uh, your, the planner assigned to your district, unfortunately, uh, is out and he could not be here. But we have lots of data that's available on our website in terms of demographic. We've done lots of studies. So I encourage folks to look at that data. I think it can be helpful in kind of give, help, helping you, A, wrap your head around, I think, what's going on in the city, a little bit about zoning and land use, but also about specific topics, whether it be about open space, transportation, or jobs. There's a lot of data that's available there. Also demographic data as well. So what's the purpose of zoning? So zoning exists today to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of all uh, of all of the users of this, in the city of New York. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit just about the history of New. York. So zoning came about. Um, so we had rapid population growth and density, and we needed early regulations for safety, light, and air. And you can see some very early images of sort of you know these unprecedented sort of growth and development that took place. Um, Buildings were regulated, so you can see here on uh, on the left uh, an icon of a tenement building. Uh, so pre-regulation, you can sort of see the the iteration. So in from in 1867, fire escapes were introduced. You had sort of the old law where light shafts and windows were introduced, and then you know from 1901 to 1929, you had stronger enforcement, and you saw some larger courtyards. And if you're familiar with some of the older buildings around the city and including in the Bronx, a lot of the buildings have, you know, in, they have inner courtyards and outer courtyards. Um, how buildings were regulated. So the zoning resolution came into, into existence in 1916, and it was a part of a reaction to buildings like the Equitable Building, uh, which you can see here, which really had, it had no, uh, uh, it had no, no real regulations. Um, and, you know, and, and so, um, and it was reacting to unsafe working conditions, including uh, those in the textile industry. So the city began to be regulated according to three kinds of districts. So there were use districts, which separated the use districts. You had height districts, which introduced something called the sky exposure plan. And then you had area districts, um, which specified yards, courts, types, and sizes of residents. In 1961, the zoning resolution came into play, and it was based originally on tower in the park uh, topology. Uh, there was a focus really on uh, open space ratios, um, and then also on oriented auto oriented design. As you as you all may know, at that time uh, there was a huge push for suburbanization. The car, the, the advent of the car had had boomed, and so people were moving to the suburbs because they had access to vehicles. So all of this sort of played a role in sort of the construction of the of the current of the zoning resolution in 1961. So zoning changes since 1961. So the city had to respond to new development and planning changes. Uh, these are just a few examples. Um, so, contextual zoning from 1987 to 89, um, introduced in the late 80s in order to produce buildings that were consistent with existing neighborhood character. And that's really important because what that does in contextual districts, it uh, allows for predictability for folks to know what's going to be built. And so, there's consistency there. So, you know, the heights of the buildings, they all have the same regulations in terms of yards and site yards. So, that's really important. Uh, mixed use districts were introduced in 1997. 
uh, to allow mixes uses concurrently. Um, these are particularly in areas where residential development could coexist with existing manufacturing uses. And what I'll point out here is that in MX districts, these are not heavy manufacturing uses. These are going to be light manufacturing uses. So like a woodworker, things that are compatible uh, with residential districts. Uh, also, the public realm, a lot of zoning changes um, have, be, have been made to improve the pedestrian experience in the public realm on streets or in public spaces and plazas and to increase uh, access to uh, public access to the waterfront. Um, zoning has also been used as a tool to facilitate the development of affordable housing across the city, including, including the city's mandatory inclusionary housing text amendment and also quality housing. And then lastly, many changes have been have been passed to address the impacts of coastal flooding and sea level rise across the city of New York. Um, so just a little bit about uh, who has the authority in terms of uh, different city agencies. So the city charter gives authority uh, to this uh, to city planning to provide technical assistance for and develop changes to zoning resolutions. The planning commission and act zoning maps, uh, zoning map and text changes. The buildings departments, they are an enforcement agency, so they will interpret the zoning resolution and they will enforce zo zoning codes. And then you also have the board of standards and appeals, which will grant variances to zoning for hardships on unique sites. So as a right development, so the majority of development in New York City. Uh, is as a right development um, that happens in accordance with the zoning resolution and the building code, and that's considered as a right. What this really means here is that DOB will review plans for compliance with the zoning resolution and with other uh, applicable codes that includes fire codes and things of that nature. And DCP review is not needed in this case. Uh, I would note that over 90% of development happens across New York City uh, in this way. So. Just want to clarify a few things. So, in terms of what zoning does and doesn't do, so zoning determines what is permitted to be built and establishes patterns of development. It also influences the size of buildings, the shape of the buildings, and the permitted uses. What zoning does not do, it doesn't actually build anything in order for something to be built. Uh, obviously, depending on you know the type of use and size, you know someone has to own the property. You know, if it, you know, there could be financing involved depending on who the developer is, uh, but the zoning itself doesn't actually build anything. Um, it, gener it will generate development if local conditions are not favorable to development, um, and, it it, and it does not require teardown of existing buildings. So, for example, uh, if there is a piece of property that is zoned for commercial use, for industrial uses, let's say, and it becomes rezoned for residential, that does not mean that that exists, that, that, that business has to go out of business or it has to be torn down. That business can remain uh, for as long as, you know, the person owns the lease or the property owner feels that that, that use is actually necessary and a, and a viable use of their property. So how dense can a building be? So here, it just gives you an example of, you know, some different scenarios in terms of, uh, so floor area ratio, which is how we determine what can be built on a site. Um, so it is really important uh, to sort of look at the, the look at this scenario right here. So um, floor area ratio tells you how much floor area can be get on a given zoning lot, and is the measurement of the building's floor area in relation to the size of the parcel. Um, the zoning district that a site is, is located in will influence the size and the shape of that building, but sets a maximum FAR. And here you see four different examples of a two FAR on a 10,000 square foot lot um, in different scenarios. So how dense can a building be? Uh, so these give you a few different examples. So one is a tower in the park. So you can see here uh, the size of a lot and given the zoning district, you have a 2.6 FA here, FAR here on the right. Uh, so because of open space regulations for the zoning district, uh, buildings oftentimes can have lower four areas than traditional buildings that may be more dense from the street. And then you can see here on the right, some traditional uh, neighborhood configurations here uh, with different floor area ratios on different blocks. So how tall and how wide can a building be? Um, so um, I mentioned earlier the zoning is influenced by the size and shape of the buildings. The size and shape that is permitted by zoning is called a building envelope. 
Uh, the building envelope is influenced by a few factors, including the building height and then how far back from the street and other buildings it must be. So in some scenarios, you, a building will have what's called a setback. Uh, so a building could rise, for example, to a height of 60 feet and may need to set back anywhere from 10 to 20 feet before it can rise and, you know, and achieve its full height. Uh, and you see that in many districts across the city, including in districts here in the Bronx. So the city is divided into several zoning districts, types of districts. The first is residential. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but when you see an R in front of a district, uh, that's for residential. When you see a commercial, uh, C, that's for a commercial district, and M is for manufacturing. And, and then as the numbers go up, the intensity of those uses increases. And then the last number, if there's a dash, will uh, indicate um, what the parking requirements are uh, in that particular district. So zoning and Bronx Community District 12. So a uh, couple of things here that I want to point out. Um, Zola is a great tool. If you guys have not used Zola, I would encourage you to go on. So Zola is is a New York City uh, zoning and land use tool. Uh, there are many different uh, configurations on here. You can toggle and turn things off. So you can find things like plate elevations. You can find out council districts. You can also map uh, if there are historic districts. Uh, you can do the Senate districts. You can also do the city council districts. Uh, and here you can see sort of a, this is a screenshot from Zola uh, from board 12. And you can see here, and I'll just point out that uh, a lot of your board is mostly residential. Your commercial development is concentrated along uh, White Plains Road and Gun Hill Road. Uh, you have medium density to not really high density commercial district. I'm sorry, residential districts. Um, but I encourage folks, this is a great tool uh, for you to find out, A, what zoning is. The also thing, other thing I will say is when you click on some of these, you will click on a district, for example, you can get a description of that particular district. It will take you to a different page, which will describe the particular zoning district in greater detail. So how to read a zoning map. So uh, A, so if you look at there, the dotted line will indicate a recent uh, rezoning. Uh, B uh, ind indicates the zoning district, so there'll be a letter and a number, and then C will indicate, you can see there in gray, where, in the gray tone, where there may be a, a special district may be indicated. And so there are zoning maps for the entire city of New York. Uh, they are on our webpage. Uh, they're important tools. They will actually give you the details, the meets and bounds of the different zoning districts in a particular area. I will just note that there's not the zoning maps don't exist for the entire district. They're also they're actually in sections because they have so much detail, uh, but they are useful tools as well. Another tool to understand uh, what's taking place in the district, what's mapped uh, there today, and be able to understand special purpose districts and also where uh, recent changes have been made. Um, so, how can you access the zoning resolution? Uh, so it can be it's available online. Uh, you can go through. You can actually search for certain things. So if you're looking for uh, uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, if you're looking for things on, you can look up any number of things. So lots of things there that you can search for uh, in the zoning resolution, uh, which is available on our website as well. Um, as I mentioned before, you can use the Zola portal. Uh, again, you can get a lot of detailed information on. Uh, on particular zoning districts. You can also zoom in uh, completely and uh, zoom in on particular lots and it can give you information. So here you see a particular address. It tells you um, the zone that it's in. It tells you the size of the lot. So it gives you the lot area. It gives you the coverage. It tells you exactly uh, what's on there today, what's permitted in, ter in terms of zoning. Uh, so you get a lot of detailed information here. It also tells you um, what community district it's in when you zoom in like this. You can also find out what council district and it also tell you the block and the lot. So what zoning change so what zoning changes might be proposed? So or why might zoning changes be proposed? So they may support planning goals and a vision for the future, uh, balance future development and existing character. Also may bring existing buildings or uses into compliance or conformance. Or more, or it also means it's change the density or the use. Um, I would note that 
Private applications are advised to seek input from local communities and elected officials before they even craft their proposal and come to us. Uh, so lots of times we have what are called informational interest meetings here. Uh, so we will meet with uh, with development teams. Uh, we also encourage them once they have met with us and they've also met with elected officials and they have somewhat of a crafted proposal to meet with community boards. Um, as a liaison, I've, I was uh, involved in many projects where they went to the board several times to get input on things from you know the heights of the buildings. Uh, one particular project, they had some very you know um, lively discussions about the types of commercial uses and uh, looking at community needs and what would be on the ground floor of the building. So it's a good opportunity. We encourage them. We can't make them come, but we really do encourage them to come because obviously you guys should play a critical role. You get play a critical role in voting up or down. Uh, a particular proposal, and it's to their benefit and to everyone else's to have those discussions and make sure that uh, that the proposal, to the best of their ability, is aligning with the goals and visions that you guys have for your neighborhood. I'll also just note that zoning is one of many planning tools and strategies, so that includes housing. Uh, we also look at community resources. Jobs and businesses are also critically important. You know, one of the things that I say all the time is that you know, changing the zoning and land use is one thing, but the other components that make neighborhoods whole, so access and mobility, housing, jobs, open space, those are all really part and parcel of what I call like sort of community planning, which I think is really important. Um, so these are some other tenets which I think are really important in terms of how zoning and land use work sort of in tandem with other tools. Um, I'm going to stop there and I want to see if folks have any questions for me before I even uh, dive into the EULA process. So, and I, I will fully recognize that's a lot of it's, th this is a lot of information I know to take in. So, 1 of the other things I want to just also point out to folks is that uh, we're happy to come back. Uh, and do something more detailed at a committee level. I know you have a land use committee. Um, well, uh, so we're happy to do that as well. Um, recognizing, and listen, like I said, I've been doing this for 17 years. Um, still learning a lot of things all the time and know this is a lot for folks to digest. Also, just you knowing that, listen, the, your responsibility in terms of zoning and land use is really important, but it, in order for you to be able to really do your, your job and represent your communities, it's really important for you to know and sort of understand like what all this means, how it affects the neighborhood, and then what your role is and how you can sort of opine and chime in on projects and proposals. Thank you so much. We do have some questions for you, Paul. Okay. We're going to start with Luke. Okay. Hey, Luke, Paul. Thanks so much, Kenny. Uh, yes, uh, you're a little faint, but yes. I was wondering if you could explain what transit oriented development is. Sure. So transit oriented development is sort of, it's a, it's a type of planning. And it really is really focusing on, uh, creating, creating density around, uh, around, uh, good transit access. And so, you know, we have what are called transit districts and transit zones across the city, but it's really relevant. It's really predicated on having good access to uh, to public transportation. So that could be uh, regional rail, could also mean subways and buses, uh, but it really is is the, the concept of uh, generating density or more density closer uh, to transit hubs. So obviously when you have you get less access to transit, less, when you have less access to transit, you wanna have, you, you, you wanna sort of, you know, promote, you know, a little bit less density, but as you get closer to transit, obviously, also the assumption is that people will be using mass transit uh, in in greater and greater numbers, and there'll also be less car ownership. Not that's not always the that's not always the case, obviously, because there are lots of people that live close to mass transit, myself included, who own a car. So that's not all, but th but that's a general principle. Thank you. Now we're going to go to Alfredo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, uh, Paul. Yes. How are you, Alfredo Figueroa? Um, thank oh, you. Well. For How are you? I'm good, my brother. Very, very, very informative. Um, as um, quite so, my question is: Is, is there being that you was a DM and you know a little bit about you know what goes on in our communities? Um. What we're experiencing up in community board 12 is like, um, as of right developments. I know you probably hear this all the time, but my thing is, is there something we can do like at a legislative level that we can ma mandate 
whomever's gonna build a property in any city, in any one of the five boroughs, that they have to come before the community board to at least present it. The reason why I'm saying this is that we've been having a lot of issues with developers coming up here and buying properties, knocking them down, and building, uh, you know, three, four-story buildings, which is, you know, permitted as of right in R five. And you know, what you have is you have existing one-story houses next to a four-story building. So a lot of constituents come to us and complain and say, "Oh, why we let them do this and why we let them do that," and we try to explain to them. You know that you know if it's, if it's an as of right development, they don't have to come to the board for approvals. Um, is there something or some way that we could put that they have to come to us to at least present their projects to us, whether it's permitted as of right or not? Like that, when people come to us, we can at least know and explain to them that the people did come, they did present it to us, and we could have some sort of understanding. You know how what to give back to the community. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a great question. And, you know, listen, you know, having been a DM and Bill works in the, so it happens a lot, you know, unfortunately, like we can't, there, there's nothing legislate like at this like, that we can force people to do. What I will say, though, is that, and I, I, I don't know that this is the case uh, in, um, in, in uh, CD 12, but when projects are getting any type of public financing, so in some cases they will get financing from HPD. In other cases, they may get financing from the state. Uh, and one of the things that we do, um, if they come through us for, for a discretionary action, uh, you know, we're, and they're getting money for the, so so we we tell them, and HPD will, you know, almost mandate that they come to the board. Um, so that's that's one lever that we have, but that's only if they that's only if they're getting any sort of public financing. So one one thing I would say is that you know we'll, you know anything. You know, anything that's getting finance from HPD and they're, they're, they're very good about making sure that they come to you guys. The other thing I would say is that if they're not getting city subsidy, if they're getting financing from the state in some capacity, you know, maybe, you know, working with state electives, you know, because at some point they have, they, they have to go through some process to get that funding. And so somewhere in that somewhere in that structure, someone would know about those. So that is one way that's a, that's another route that you can go. But unfortunately, legislatively, unless they are coming through for a discretionary action or they're getting some kind of funding, it's really hard to regulate. But I, I, I hear you. I, you know, the similar things were happening in Board Four, where up in Highbridge, if you're familiar, where people were they were buying like you know they had these really big stately homes and they were they bought them, and so now what you're seeing are a lot of these you know some as a right development. A few of them did come to us as a courtesy, which we appreciated. But to your point. A lot of them do not like they, you know, they they do what they need to do with buildings. They build whatever they're going to build, and you know, and, and and that's that. I will also just point out, you know, um, if you if you if you see anything that you think might be an issue, definitely call three one one, report it to buildings. That's you know, that's another way to at least make sure that they are, are following the rules and being respectful of the existing uh, existing residents that are living there today. All right, my brother, appreciate you, man. No problem. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, just to remind everybody, you know, committee is really land use committee. Get yourself familiar when we have all these committee meetings. That's when we can have these larger conversations at large. Paul, we will definitely have you back. Um, Ms. Granby, if you can add your question to the chat, that would be great. Uh, we can continue, Paul. Okay. Um, so uh, no more, any more questions? No, nope. not, not from the board. No. Okay. We're, we're going to save the rest of the questions. Anybody aside from board members, if you can add your questions in the chat, we will get to them. All right. So bear with me as I navigate this to, to go to my, to go to my other presentation. I am not, I, again, we, do, we do not, we don't use WebEx. We use teams at, at, uh, in the, at the city. So bear with me one second while I stop this one and go to my next presentation. Uh, where um, am I? Getting? And Paul, will you be able to share the the presentation with us? Absolutely, I can email. I can email those to you. Beautiful. Okay, we'll send it out for everyone that's interested. Okay, so let's do. All right. So can you see that one? Can you see that? Yes, we can. All right. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the second module. So. This is going to focus on a city's land use review procedure. So, 
Um, this is really important for you guys because this is the city's process that you guys are. You guys are sort of the first stop uh, when when this process begins, and you guys have sixty days. So, I'm gonna walk through sort of the ULA process, like well, you know what all that means. Talk a little bit about the detail, and then uh, I want to highlight a few things that I think are really important. And then again, you know, we'll also take questions. So, uh, so what is ULERP? What is a land use application? What information is in, in, is enclosed is contained in the land use application? And then what is the public review process and what does that really look like? And sort of who is involved and who are the key players? So, um, so what is ULERP? So ULERP stands for the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure. Uh, procedure. It's a public review process. Uh, which encompasses many different types of land use actions. Uh, and once they get adopted, they become law. As a board member, you guys play a really critical role in this ULA process. As I mentioned, once an application has been certified by the commission to enter public review, the community board is the first place uh, that it goes to for a review and vote as part of the, as part of the ULA process. So in New York City, there are a few different pathways um, for development, so there's as a right, which we talked a little bit about earlier. So that is development that complies with the zoning resolution and the building code that is regulated by the Department of Buildings. Then you have what are called discretionary actions and discretionary actions are anything that is subject to approval. And so there are two paths there. One is through the Board of Standards and Appeals, and those are usually for variances where there are hardships on a property where they can essentially build as a right pursuant to the zoning, but they may have an issue with a steep slope. They may have an issue where uh, they, they need to reduce the, you know, the rear yard for some reason. And so in those cases, they wouldn't come to the planning commission. Uh, they would go to the board of standards of appeal. Uh, and then the other path obviously is a Euler path where they're looking to change the, the zoning on a piece of property, or in some cases, several properties. And so they would come to come to the department, submit an application and then come, go through the public review process. Um, so, what are discretionary actions? So, discretionary. So, decision makers need to make need to up uh, need up to date and factual information to guide recommendations and votes. So, this is really where the land use application really come in uh, and play a role. So, these are not all of them, but these are some of the, the different types of actions that are subject to you. Look, some of these you will see example like sanitary or, or waterfront landfills. It is a land use action. I will be honest with you. I, in, at least in my experience, I've not seen one of those, but I will say, for example, zoning map amendments. We see that a lot in urban development action areas in the Bronx. We have many, many, many of those. So you may, depending on where you're located in the Bronx, see applications for uh, what are called UDAP designations. Disposition of city owned property. So in many and in, in several instances, I'll give I'll think of I'm trying to think of one. So um, I'm thinking of the top of my head, but that's another action where the city will dispose of property for development. You will see that sometimes in what are called requests for proposals where either the city may be doing an RFP. So that may be the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. You also may see um, uh, the New York City Economic Development Corporation engage uh, in RFPs and there may be a disposition of city owned property. So also changes to the city map. So that includes mapping and sort of demapping, particularly for streets. That can happen for any number of reasons. It could happen because you want to expand, you know, use a street bed to expand a park or a plaza or for any number of or you also may want to map a street that's built but not actually existing on the city map. And then you also have acquisition of real property by the city. Uh, you have site selection for capital projects. So, and that in many cases, that would be that can be for public facilities. So, if you're building a new library, a fire station, a uh, a pre police precinct, that would fall under under that category. Uh, and then you have combination acquisition and site selection, and then revocable consents. And then also you have housing and urban renewal plans that are pr project pursuant to city, state, and federal, federal law. So this is sort of a, a wide range of sort of the most common things that are subject to ULERP. Um, there are some others that are, that are a little bit more complicated. You don't see as often where, um, you know, we'll do a general large scale, which is sort of very detailed in terms of, you know, submitting site plans for the development of what's considered a, a large site. And that's, uh, but that's not as often, uh, but these are some of the more common things that you will see. So, What's the information that's included in the land use application? So 
some of the things that you have to answer if you're a private applicant or if even you're a city applicant. We are in the process right now in this office. We're working on the uh, the the Bronx Metro North study, so we'll have to do an application. So whether you're it's a city sponsored initiative or a private applicant, you have to talk about you have to you have to answer these questions. So what are the proposed actions? What are the requested actions? Um, so you have to uh, complete that and fill out this form. There are also lots of other forms and documents that are included. There are maps that you have to include. There will be ownership forms. Uh, so there's a lot of detail that goes into that land use application. I also want to point out for you guys is that um, there's a we have a tool called Zap, and so Zap is for any uh, zoning applications. So once an application is filed, even if it's in draft form, it is public. So once it is public, you guys can view those applications, and I encourage you as a citizen, anyone can go onto Zap and you can do a search by community district. If you know the specific address of a project, you can look it up. Uh, via that address, and you can actually see the status of that project, and you can, also, you can also click on and see the details behind the land use application. So I encourage folks, if you have or know about things and you know things are filed, or even if you're just curious um, to take a look at, you know, what might be happening in your neck of the woods. Uh, so again, what else is included in this land use application? So you have to describe the proposed development. So in this case, you know, a residential building, and it has to be detailed. It is really important to know. So in this particular case, uh, it's 24,000 square feet. You know, the proposed actions would facilitate a 12-story building. Um, so all of those things are are real are also an important component, and they're a requirement. I will also just say that for every land use application, as we work with private applicants and we work through the application process, there are standards that they have to meet in terms of the type of information that they have to supply for the application and then the documents that support those. So that includes maps and other things, depending on the types of actions uh, that they're requesting uh, from the city. Uh, so why are the actions requested? So again, you know, they'll, they will. So in this particular case, so you need uh, these are all zoning map amendments. So you can see here, this is uh, manufacturing districts to residential and it gives you a description of sort of, you know, what the proposed development uh, would would facilitate and what the existing context of the development today. So you have to describe sort of, you know, what's on those sites today. Are there vacant? Are there existing uses? You have to give a context of the neighborhood. You have to really build a story and a narrative that supports your land use action. So talking about, so in many cases, so if you're looking at, for example, a lot that may be underutilized or may be vacant, but it may be surrounded by maybe a six to eight story apartment building. So in some cases, what an you know, applicant may do is they may point to that surrounding contents, context to support their proposed, the proposed actions and the proposed district that they select. I will also just note that, you know, we take, you know, sort of the crafting those actions very seriously. And the other thing that we do when applicants come to us, and as you might imagine, Everyone, you know, they're going to come to us and say, oh, we want our 10, but the reality is that, you know, listen, as planners, we have to be mindful of the fact that we have to take into, into account that, yes, there is a housing crisis. We want to facilitate, you know, affordable housing and development, but we also take, have to take into account that there are existing neighborhoods and there's existing context, so we have to balance those out. And sometimes that can be a challenge, but it is really important for us to do uh, as a department and also, as, you know, as a borough office. So other information, so where the project is proposed. So it's important to, and you can see this map here. So, you know, you have here outlined sort of the project area. You have sort of a general context here. So you can see the existing zoning districts and what they propose. So this is real, this is also another important component of the application uh, that's required uh, for that. And this is a, a, a zoning and a land use map together. So you can see uh, the purple is really more your manufacturing. Uh, you'll have the blue, which is typically so public facilities. So that might be schools, hospitals, things of that nature. And then your resident, your red is going to be sort of your commercial. Also, might be some other industrial uses. And then your residential is typically going to be yellows, oranges, and that could be a range of you know one to two family buildings. In the oranges, you'll see more of your larger sort of either walk up or elevator uh, residential development. So the public review process. So this is the time where every entity, every stakeholder that's involved in that process uh, chimes in on a particular proposal or an application. Um, that includes a community board. That includes a borough president. In some cases, it includes what's called borough board. And I know that uh, 
uh, the board chair is familiar with borough board because uh, he attends every month. And then all, and then after that, it will go to uh, the city planning commission, and then it will go to city council. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happens at each of those steps, and then who's required to hold hearings and things of that nature. Uh, so this gives this is a graphic of sort of the public review. So certification happens now before a project gets certified. You know, we as a department have to make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So there is the application. Of course, and there's also the environmental review that's required. So we have an environmental review division downtown that we work with. It's one of our specialty divisions, and they help us work with the applicant. And typically, the applicant will have a uh, a consultant that does the environmental uh, the environmental assessment. And we need to make sure that you know th that uh, it meets all the requirements for what's called CEQA, which is a city environmental quality review, and that is the environmental process that we go through in terms of assessing the impacts of proposed actions in a neighborhood. So all of that have to happen uh, before an, uh, an application can certify. Uh, it's important to note that, you know, we certify a project. It does not mean that the CPC or this borough office is, a, is, is endorsing a project, but by law, once an application has been filed and has met all the requirements, we have a responsibility as a city agency, as a city, to allow those applications to move through the public review process. So that is really important. So again, you know, sort of looking across here, as I mentioned before, community boards are the first stop, then the borough president, then it goes to the planning commission, city council, and then the last stop uh, would be the mayor's office or the mayor himself. One question, so, Paul. Yes, go ahead. So yep. you're at community boards, right? Let's yep. say it came to us and we said no. Um, then what happens? So, the, so the good question. So one thing I will say, so it goes to the borough president, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it will go to the borough president, goes to the planning commission. So one thing, so and they, so and so what happens is you guys are required to hold a pu uh, a public hearing. The borough president is not required, but typically they will hold a public hearing, particularly on items that are are sort of critical to neighborhoods, and they want and the borough president typically wants to give people an opportunity uh, to speak and hear from folks uh, if they so choose on items. The planning commission and city council both will hold public hearings. Uh, I just want to point out the importance of those recommendations. So you said you voted down and say no. So it's really important for, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, when you vote up or down to tell us why. Um, because the planning commission, as well as the city council, they want to know that so they can figure out, you know, if they're going to like to take that into a, in consideration. So you may vote it down and say no because of, uh, you know, so you got it's a 20 story building and you think it's too high. So, and I'm just giving you an example. So, as it moves through the process, the borough president may see that they may be in agreement with you. Their recommendation may also echo those sentiments. Then, when it gets to the commission and the council, that's an opportunity for folks to. So, what will happen at those? So, both of those entities will hold public hearings. So, they also at the planning commission, we do what's called a uh, pre hearing review. And that's where the planner and the office that's assigned to that project reports back to the commission what they've heard so far um, from the community boards and their recommendation and the borough president. So those recommendations are important. Um, I don't want people to think that those recommendations are just a fait accompli and that no one listens to them. They are important parts of the process and I want to encourage um, board 12 and all the boards to use that as a as a tool to communicate your likes or dislikes of a proposal, but communicate it in a way to let us let us and let the city know why you don't like something. Uh, there have been many cases where boards will just say submit a no and we don't know. And so, but we want to know. So you're saying no, but we want to know why you're saying no. So that is really important um, now. And, and to your point, so you voted down no now again. Depending on what the project is and how, so the and again, if the no is no with conditions or no, so it may so that no may get approved along the way, but that no may influence how it gets approved in that process. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. But just so, yeah, I just wanted to make clear that we are advisory, right? So. Like you said, it's important you, you, to know the why. Yeah, you you are advisory, but I, you know, I really so as a when I was a DM, you know, so I told my board we are whether we're voting it up and down, we always have to have 
conditions. And I, I'm not, and so that was my, that was, as a DM, that was my rule. I thought it was, you know, it was really important, you know, um, and not for all, but for probably 90% of what we did through, during my tenure, we had some conditions. I thought, you know, listen, you kind of throw this, the kitchen sink out there and you kind of see what sticks. I thought it was important that, you know, that we were, you know, giving a point of view and perspective on a project. It also gives people a flavor of, and sort of, you mentioned vision, so it gives people people a sense of what your what your vision is in terms of you know projects and i will also just say that you know listen developers other people will look at those recommendations and how boards vote on things as they're crafting proposals so all of that it all works in tandem so it is really important for you to submit those recommendations and to put some teeth behind it in one way shape or form from my perspective so i, I encourage folks to do that and it's and it's helpful for us um, in this office, you know, whether it's on that project or moving forward to know what the, what the, in that moment in particular, what the board is thinking as it relates to whether, you know, affordability levels, if it's affordable housing project, um, it may be about heights and density, whatever that may be. But that information is really important for, for not just as a part for the city to know where, you know, where you guys stand on things. So, um, so once an application is certified, the board will have 60 days to review those materials. Um, the application, so you will have to, you're required to hold a public hearing. I also just want to note that the public hearing has to be noticed and you have to do that in the city record. Um, I think it's, I believe it's 5 days before the hearing is to take place. Um, that is really important because your hearing is not only an opportunity for the applicant to come and present to the board. It's also an opportunity for the community at large to come and hear about the proposal and the presentation. And for you as a board, you guys are representing your communities, but to hear what the community at large might have to say about those proposals. So, um, so it's also an opportunity for board members to ask questions. Um, I'm not sure how you guys do things, but in some, in many boards, a lot of these land use applications will go through the land use committee and they may not, the full board may not see it until it actually comes for, uh, through the ULOR process and for public hearing. So it's an opportunity for the board at large to be able to ask questions uh, to the applicant and the development team. Um, as I mentioned before, you have to hold a public hearing. Um, and then, you know, it's really important you consider how, how the application does, and we talked about this or, or does not, you know, sort of fulfill or sort of align with your vision for the community. Um, does it, is it consistent with things that you put in your district needs statement? Is it consistent with whether you've created a vision document or whether you just articulated or what you're thinking? It may be something that's related to what's happening in the district or happening, you know, just policy citywide at that moment. You know, just consider all, all those things when you're, you, you, when you're considering these applications and, you know, sort of the pros and cons. So your recommendation, so you have three options, approve, disapprove, or recommend with modifications and conditions. Um, again, I think, you know, in all three of these, so I, I've seen approve with conditions. I've seen, you know, disapprove, you know, with, you know, with conditions. But I think, again, the conditions, the thing I want to focus on here or for the, you know, underscore is that it is important to, for us to know what, you know, where you're coming from. Um, so voting it up, if you approve is great, if you just want to do it like that, but particularly if you're going to disapprove it for, you know, for, I think for everybody to know why. It's also an opportunity for you to just to, to memorialize that, that why, whatever that may be, because it's on the record, it becomes public record, not only for this application, it also becomes part for every ULIP application. The planning commission, once they vote, we have to uh, do a report, a city planning commission report, those recommendations and uh, however you vote on those become part of that public record and become part of that document. Uh, so it is, so those recommendations are important. And even though they are advisory, I, I will say that, uh, you know, I think, you know, the commission, the borough president and the council, like they, they look at those recommendations and, you know, that test that, you know, as part of their consideration of these applications, they look at those and I, I think they take them seriously. So I think it is important for, you know, for boards to, um, to, you know, go through the process, all those public hearings. I know that, you know, like having been a DM with the board, sometimes you feel like your voice is not heard, but I do think it's important. Sometimes you have to kind of say the same thing over and over and over again to get traction. Um, but the, the saying is the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So 
if you're not saying anything, then people don't really know where you're coming from. And so, the, you know, what happens is that as a city, you know, we're operating in a vacuum. So that it is an important tool. Um, I know that sometimes, you know, you feel like you go through this process and then things get approved. But I, I, it is important to have those things on the record, even if you're just able to point to them moving forward to say, this is how we voted on X project, which is very similar to this one. So, um, uh, so this is just an example of a recommendation. So in this particular case, uh, the board voted 13 in favor, uh, four opposed with uh, modifications or conditions. Um, you can attach your conditions. Uh, listen, I also want to point out to folks, um, there's a form that you get um, and to the DM. Uh, you're not relegated to that form. I will just say as a DM, you know, I would submit the form as sort of a cover sheet and sometimes I would have a memo that was attached that sort of enumerated what the conditions are or what our thinking was. In some cases, you know, I was the, the DM when we approved Jerome Avenue. That was many, many pages that we sort of enumerated some very specific things. So um, there are opportunities to do things out, you know, beyond the scope of just submitting this, this form and ticking off a box. So, so don't feel like you're boxed in and that you can't say more if you'd like to about a particular application. So the next step in the process, again, is the borough president. So um, the borough president will have 30 days to consider that application. Uh, so they will so they will um, sometimes be a borough board review, depending if it touches more than one community district, it will come to borough board. Uh, and then the borough president will typically hold a hearing and then they will issue uh, a recommendation. Again, the borough president, you know, will definitely look at what the community board recommendation said and weigh and and weigh that you know in terms of the the, the you know their own perspective and then submit a recommendation that will then you know go on to the both recommendations will go on to the city planning commission. Uh, so the commission is going to review the application. Uh, the commission is also required pursuant to the charter to hold a public hearing, the same as the community board. Uh, they will issue, uh, they will vote on these items. And then, as I mentioned before, they will issue a, a report uh, that goes to the city council. And the commission gets 60 days once the borough president has submitted their recommendation uh, to hold a public hearing and to consider the pros and cons and what they've heard from both the community boards and from their public hearing, the borough president, and then, you know, submit their vote and recommendation, which will go to the council. And the next step in the process is it goes to the council. Um, the council will have 50 days to consider that. The council also will hold public hearings, uh, and then the council will vote on those items as well. Uh, and then the last step, you know, if you know, if if that happened, is the 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 mayor does at the very end have the capability to review. Um, you know, and they have five calendars, you know, to decide to review an application, and they also have the opportunity to veto the vote of the city council. Um, it's also important to note that the city council can subsequently uh, override the mayor's vote if they have a uh, if they have by a two uh, two to three margin. Um, so that's really sort of a you know the, the overview of the ULO process. And again, I want to you know open it up and uh, to questions uh, from folks either the, on. Anything that I've said here or on the process, et cetera. So, Carl, do you have any questions or comments? Carl Stricker is the chair of our, our land use. Uh, no, I don't. I, I was, it was a great presentation. Uh, a lot of it I knew, but, uh, you know, but most of the board members do not know. And I, I couldn't I tell you, it was one of the best presentations I've heard in a long, long time concerning land use. Well, and I want to thank I want to thank him for coming up and explaining it. It means our meeting's longer tonight, but every minute he spent here was informative to everybody who's on the on the board meeting tonight. Yeah, and I just wanna I just wanna reiterate again, you know, we're again I, you know, um and I, I and I, I, I appreciate, you know, like you you know, you've seen this information a lot. I also know that, you know, the boards will, you know, you will continue to get new members. 
Uh, there's a lot more sort of, you know, turnover on the boards for any number of reasons. And so you get new people. And so, you know, so you're sort of starting from scratch. So, you know, one, two things I want to say. One, I want to definitely, you know, offer up an opportunity. So if you want, if you'd like myself or, you know, I plan to come back and either give this presentation, talk about zoning. Also, if you guys have questions about things, uh, you know, it's really important to me, you know, for us to be a resource to the boards. Um, as I mentioned before, I know that, um, there's a lot of there are a lot of land use and zoning things that come your way, uh, and you guys. That, uh, but that's not your only responsibility. You have everything from from transportation, you do district needs, constituent service. There's a lot on your plate. So what whatever we can do as a as a department and an office uh, to help you guys navigate that, you know, def we definitely want to be a resource. Thank you. We definitely. I want just to want to tell you, I might ask you to come back to a land use committee uh, down the road a little bit. Uh, absolutely, you know, um, uh, Beatrice, she, she has my, she has my number and my email. So, you know, we're happy to, and uh, unfortunately, like I said, you know, the planner assigned to your, to your board, uh, he's out on, he's out on vacation. Good for him. Uh, but, um, but, you know, he, you know, he'll definitely be, you know, attending your meetings. Um, and he's, uh, he's great. And so, you know, if you want us to come back, you know, in the fall or at any time, we can, we're happy to do so. We do have some questions, but I do, yep. I would like to invite you to come back if possible. Look, we only have May and June left. Um, and I do, I would like to spend some time, um, if Carl allows at his next committee meeting, you know, you did touch up on how the board, although we are advisory, right? And I think mm -hmm. you and I spoke about this, like there's a possibility that the board, um, aside from its main responsibilities can at some point have a vision for this district and put in some sort of, is there like a process, how we would put in an application, a proposal, like how does that work for us? So when you so when you say so when you say vision, are you talking more sort of like at a at a sort of a high level sort of like a policy statement about like what you see as sort of like key components because uh, it can it can manifest itself in 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 a, in a bunch. So I'm trying to like just get to like what 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 the end product is or which what the end product under, would be. Let's say it's an underutilized space. Sure. Um, Alfredo even brought up legislation, right? There's a few yep. different ways that we are seeing, like, how can, you know, we have, aside from our board members, there's community residents that are here. We each have a vision for our district. How do we make some of these ideas come alive, right? We went, I participated in a presentation where, so you're taking to I participated in a presentation where the presenters said that, before things come to us, whether it's from the mayor, whoever, developers, as of right before things come to us, we do have an opportunity to present what our vision is under the utilized space and development, something we may want to see. We don't know how to go about that, right? And so I know city planners are instrumental in helping us. So, so a couple of things I will say. So, you know, we won't write your vision per se, but one thing I will, one thing I, I will say is that, you know, there's, I, I, this is, and this is just my perspective. I think that, you know, data, statistics, information are important to support people's points. So if we can be helpful in helping you, you know, uh, access data and information that can, so whether it's demographic information, whether it's trends, those kinds of things that can, that, that we can definitely be helpful in that end. Uh, I would also say now, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this and I know I, I, again, I, 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 I have my own, you know, sort of issues with the community district needs statement and that process. Uh, and I can say that because I did seven of them. Uh, George has done way more than me, but doing seven of them. And, you know, listen, I, you know, we had a meeting, you know, recently here internally. And I said, listen, I said, I don't know that, you know, I said, I think, you know, uh, I think they recognize that it's a lot of work for DMs and boards to do this every year um, in the, within the construct of basically you have 60 days from September to the end of October to do budget consultation and put all this together. But I will say that um, the district needs statement is also an important document because it memorializes what you have said. Um, I will give you an example. Um, Community Board 4 had a park, uh, a parcel of land that they wanted to be converted to a park. It was on the district needs statement for 20 years. Now, that's a long time, but I will say there was a ribbon cutting for that park. Uh, Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So again, no one wants to wait twenty years. That's a very long time. But all that to say, 
That was in the district need statement as one of their top priorities. It continues to be there. They it was never removed. And so when Jerome Avenue came about and they were looking at, you know, what are the board's priorities? What are the things we can focus on? Well, that was right there. And the board was able to say, listen, this is a priority for us. It has been a priority for us. You can go back through these statements over the course of the last 20 years and read that this has consistently been there. So I think there's a there's a space for that as well. Um, whether it's, you know, a particular parcel of land, you know, in the district needs statement, you can identify, you can give a block and lot for something if you, if, you know, within your priorities, uh, that's a tool that's available to you in the, in the district needs statement. Um, I would also say when private applications do come through, that's also an opportunity for you guys to opine on, you know, a vision, if you will. So, for example, if there is a development that comes through that, and let's just say it's a housing development, and a lot of them, like, they will have, you know, ground floor uses. In some cases, I would say probably in many cases, they may or may not have tenants that thought about those uses. That's also an opportunity for you guys to, you know, put your imprint to say, these are the kinds of things that we'd like to see in the neighborhood. And listen, nothing is guaranteed, but if you put it there and you put in your conditions, that's something for, you know, these developers to consider. And that's also, that's also another way for you guys to articulate, you know, your vision, wants, and needs for, uh, for your neighborhood. Thank you, Paul. We do have Mr. Robert Hall. You have your hands up. Uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to also say that this was a very interesting, uh, this was a very interesting conversation we just had. I want to go back to what Mr. Figueroa said because I got a phone call and I hope I'm not being redundant. That's okay. Can we legislate an issue regarding the ULERP process? Can that be legislated so that a change could take place in the best interest of our particular community board? So if you want to change the ULERP process, You'd have to change the city charter. Um, that, I mean, and I will. I'll say this. So there have been there, there have been a few charter revision commissions, and they have made some changes to the charter. I don't know. I, I listen. I listen. If you don't ask, you don't know. Uh, you you'll you won't find out. So certainly put it out there. I can't say definitively that they will make changes to the charter. But if you have if you have a particular aspect of the ULR process, then I cert like certainly put it out there to the elected officials. Um, I don't, again, I'd have to do, I, I don't know, like the charter revisions, like, they, like that has to go through a whole process. It has to be voted on, but, um, you know, so I can't say that it can't happen, but that's how, that's, that's how you would change the ULR processes through the city charter. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to be certain that is something that it's been my experience. It has affected community board 12 for quite some time. The, you, trying the, to put some closure to that. So. Now, are you, is there a particular aspect of the Euler process that you're focusing on? Or do you, or do you not want to say it's a top secret? I'm joking. No, no, no this is about accountability. Okay. We want folks to come here and be accountable. We, we want to hold them accountable to what is in the best interest of this community. And Stop Euler it. doesn't give us that process. And, and that's what's being said indirectly. So that's why this conversation is even in existence. No, I listen, I, I hear you again. I like I can't I can't speak to the 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 likelihood that you could change the charter and depending on what it what it is, you know, like as I said before, there were I think under the previous administration there were two charter to uh, Two charter commissions, and there were some revisions that were. I think there were the, a lot of things that were put on the table, and then it was whittled down to I think a, 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 a few. But. Okay, we'll have you back. So thank you, thank you. I no problem. Thank yeah, you. you can join us at our committee meeting coming up next month because we have been we've been mentioning this for a bit, right? Like, how do we create that legislation piece? And yep. so the follow-up, I guess, would be George should be back. We'll continue the conversation with him and Ursula, our elected officials. But that is something that we're really adamant about, you know, and, and like you were saying, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So we definitely have a few issues that we want to get squeaky with. But um, any other questions? I like that, get squeaky with. I like that. <laughs> I like Let that. me see. We have, thank you. Uh, any other hands? Board members? Just me, uh, Beatrice. 
Go ahead, Ms. Benitez. Um, Paul, I, I, I'm so glad that you talked about the district needs statement. Mm -hmm. It's the most important document that any community board has. Uh, it's like a record history of what the needs are within the district and Absolutely. what we can approve upon. And I mm -hmm. think it's something that the board should be aware of. And, and when the question comes up and the board is asked, what do you want to put in your district needs statement? This is the this is the, the forum for that particular quest. Yep. And I'm glad you mentioned it tonight, Paul. It, you know, yeah, and I just and, and you know, and I don't want to I don't want to step on George's toes, but I'll, I'll also just say this about the need statement. And, you know, we had a, a it was an internal meeting because we, you know, 1 of our, you know, our planning support division works, you know, with boards and works on the district need statement. Um, the reality is that we know this, that, you know, within a within a community district from year to year, your priorities are not going to change drastically. The, the makeup, you know, the things in your issues and challenges are probably not going to change drastically. So you can, every year doesn't have to be a total like re redo of the district D statement. You can do sort of like within, you know, let's if you're looking at a, like from year one to year three, in that like you do a, a, a big one in year one, maybe in the middle, you're doing some you know, some cosmetic changes, you're changing the narrative, maybe, and then in year three. So there are different ways, I think, to look at it, but I, I, I do agree with you. I think it, I will all, I will say, um, listen, we still have work to do and improvements to make, I think, as a city, as a department, in terms of using that statement. One of the comments that I made, um, and I can say this because I was on the other side, uh, was that I found the responses to be from the agencies to not be helpful. Um, and if you read some of them, you, they're very benign, like, go speak to this person. Well, that doesn't really get to, so I think, you know, as a, as an agency, as a city, we're trying to figure out, um, how we can be better with that. Um, but, I, but I do think it's an important document and I, you know, I encourage you to, to use that as a, as sort of as your, as your bullhorn in some ways to articulate. You know, I think, you know, Beatrice talked about your vision, but also to articulate like what your needs and your priorities are and like, you know, and listen, you only get 40 capital and 25 expense. We, we were on the opposite at board for, so we had like, we didn't have as many capital, but they were bigger ones, but we had a lot of expense items and listen, they only were entertaining, but we kept putting them on there because we thought they were, they were important, you know, quote, critical components and pieces to, um, to the neighborhood. So. How does the board work with the city planner, our own? I'm sorry, say that again? Can boards have city planners as um, staff? Like, how does, how is that? Uh, can you have them as staff? I mean, you, I mean, are you, are you talking about, are you talking about DCP, the Bronx office, or are you talking about just like the, the board, like in and of itself? Right, so I know that you said there is a city planner within the borough president's yeah, office. Yeah, so there's, so there's a so in so in my office there's a there is a planner that is assigned to each community as a liaison. Right, and I know like city council. I know city council has their own planner as well. Yeah, they so they have their own. So they're yeah they're, they they have the, the their own land use people. Too. That's correct. Do community boards have community boards ever had city planners that they've retained or? Had as consultants. Uh, yeah, so that no, they've never, they've not had. Uh, I'm, I'm ninety nine percent sure that historic, they've not had planners like full time planners on staff. I will say, so there's a few different things, uh, you know, things that you may want to think about. Uh, so the city has a fellows program, uh, which you know could be useful if you come up and I think, I think it's once a year you submit a proposal. Um, to uh, it's all boards across the city, and they look to find a match uh, within the master's programs uh, within. So I think it's Hunter, Hunt, Hunter, um, Hunter Baruch, and a few okay. other schools. And so they'll look to see if there, there's a match there in terms of you know skills, and then a need for a project. So that's one route. Um, I will also say. There's an opportunity if you have money in your budget. These are I'm giving you ideas. I'm taking my sort of director hat and I'm just um, for you to think about if there is discretion, if you have funding in your budget, you can hire, you know, like a part time person 
create a scope of work for a project and have them do that. Um, you can also you can also do that through and you can do that through and we did that at board four through a, uh, through the um, the this, the request for discretionary funds from the council members. Uh, Paul, in reference to your thing, yes, you can get someone and hire them as a consultant to do a project if you have that much money left over in your budget, because we did it at commute, um, CB3 many yep. years ago mm -hmm. when we did the Greenway. Yep. And that's how we got it done. Yep. But, you know, that doesn't always happen that way. But that is one of the ways that you can do it besides going to the master's programs. Um, at the yeah, and, and, you know, the, 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 pro the first program I talked about, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tool that's available. It's also free, but it's also competitive. And so you could, and, you know, it's, you know, you submit it, you may or may not get, you may or may not get selected. And so that's one piece. The other piece is that you don't get to select the fellow. They select the person that they sent to you, and I will just give you my own experience. My first year, we selected a fellow. Um, it didn't go well, um, but for a number of reasons. So, um, oh, somebody's sorry. Um, someone asked why I was still sharing my screen. Apologies. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, so that, that's definitely, you know, that, that's definitely, you know, a, a con to that project because you don't get to select that person. They select them for you. The other route allows you to, you know, you, if you get the funding from, from the council member, then you can you know, write a description. The person just has to register as a vendor for the city of New York, and then you set up a, uh, you set up a process for them to be paid. Um, and we did we did that at board four. So it's a little it's a little bit more work. George is probably like, I'm gonna kill you. So it's a little bit more work on on the DM side, but it is a it is a way for you to um you know create a you know a description for you know what you're looking for in terms of skills, create a scope of work in a project and be able to get you know what you what you're actually looking for and have some you know a little bit more control in terms of how that works. Thank you so much, Paul. Carl, you had a question? Carl, I thought you wanted to say something. You're muted if you do. I'm muted myself, I'm sorry. Okay, there you go. Are you there? Yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yep. Okay, Paul, I just wanna say uh, about maybe 15, 16 years ago, this uh, was passed uh, the mayor passed a uh, ruling that all boards are allowed to have a city plan on their on their staff. But right after they did that, they cut the budget so we couldn't hire anybody. Ah, I so, didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could tell you, I've been working with city planning since Bob Esner. So uh, I don't know if you know who he was, but. Mm -hmm. But he was very influential in the Bronx City Planning Department, okay. going back to the late '60s, early '70s. And I know you weren't born then, so. But anyway, not in the '60s. Yeah. I'm born in the '70s, so yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. So you were just a toddler when I was working with Bob Esma. <laughs> so, uh, that yes, so. I was a toddler. That is true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but there, there is a provision. In the city charter somewhere. Right, right, where, right. Where the local boards can hire a city plan, a planner. It doesn't gotcha. say city planner, a planner. Gotcha. And, and the key is, you know, he who gives it, take this away. The minute they approve that, they cut the budget by 10%. So, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you're like you're standing on your head. But your presentation tonight was excellent. Yes, and thank, thank you. you. I thank you for it. Uh, my pleasure. Um, we have another hand up. Thank you, Carl. Ms. Denise Bond. <clears throat> yes, good evening. Thank you for your presentation. I just have, I just want a clarifying question just to make sure that I understand. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I'm, my name is Denise Bond. I'm the chair of the Parks and Rec for Community Board 12. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, what part of what we want to do um, in, within the Parks Committee is to have more green spaces mm -hmm. and uh, recreational areas within mm -hmm. our borders. We do, do not have enough of that. 
Mm -hmm. So if I understand through your presentation tonight, you're saying that A, that's something that we should include in our district need statement. Absolutely. Right. And, and yeah, and what I would also say, so and as specificity is helpful. So for example, so if you want, you know, more green space or it's a rec or let's just say a record and you and you have and there are and you know there are parcels of land that you guys want to identify, even if they're privately owned. Okay, that, that was there. my that was my next question. Yeah, put the because yeah, even if they're privately owned, because you know, he, you know, depending on listen, there have been there are all different kinds of instances where you know, a piece of property may be may be privately owned, but you never know what may come down the pike, and the city may may turn to that person and may try to negotiate whether it's for how opens it. You never know. So even I mean, there has to be a rationale behind it. But if you if you see something, you're like, listen, it's adjacent to wherever the whatever the case may be. But if you have ideas around that, certainly you know, put the the address or the block and lot, you know in the district needs statement uh because they, they it's e it's it's easier i shouldn't say easier it's more helpful for the agencies to be able to respond in a way that's going to be helpful to you to give you a response that's not like oh you know go see this person or there's no funding for it so the more specific you can be the the more helpful it is okay thank you you're welcome Thanks again, Paul. We welcome you to come back. We will invite you to our committee meeting. We appreciate your time and expertise and knowledge. Absolutely. My pleasure. And again, uh, thank you all for your time. And again, you know, uh, I will email, I'll email these to you tomorrow. Uh, so you have them. And again, you know, as folks have questions, if you want to email them to us, please let us know and we're happy to come back. Thank you. Have a blessed one. Okay. You guys have a good night. Oh, wait, Anthony, did you oh, have wait. a... Uh, so, someone have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, no, he didn't. Okay. okay. I thought Anthony All right, did. Did. You have a great night. Hopefully you, you won't be here too long with your meeting. I hope it didn't take up too much time, but hopefully it was, it was it useful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a good so one. Closes, you too. All right. So that closes our presentation. We're moving on. Ursula, do you have anything for us? District managers report. I know George is not um, here with us this, this month. No, I don't have anything. He's hoping to come back next month. He's doing Beautiful. well. And thanks everybody. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're moving on to the next item of our agenda, which is the approval of the board minutes. And I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we just have March 23rd board meetings to approve. Yes. Okay. So I'd like, um, can somebody make a motion? So moved by John Isaac. Ms. Benitez? You need a second? Can I get a second? Yeah, Robert Hall. Oh. Okay. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. I'm going to call. Can I just get the name of the second? I'm sorry. Who seconded? Robert Hall. Thank you. Robert Hall. I'm sorry. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Benitez. Okay. Can I call the, I'm going to call the roll now. Great. Okay. Judith Benitez. Aye. Denise Bond. Aye. Anthony Boris. Ivan, are you still here? Does anyone see him? He was on earlier. Huh? He was on earlier. I'm checking. He's there. He's there. But he's, but there. he's not answering. Ivan. Ivan, you're on mute. Board members, please t uh, unmute yourself so when I call, we can go to this very quickly. Uh, Carla Bossati. Aye. Michelle Brumfield. Aye. Victor Brown. Aye. Deacon Brown. Aye. 
Norbert Bryan. Aye. Desiree Campbell. Aye. Sadie Campbell. Aye. Joan Claude. Aye. Chris Devone. Chris Devone. Not present. Torlene Dickerson. Aye. Kevin Eichelberger. Kevin Eichelberger. Not present. Alfredo Figueroa. Alfredo? Aye. Thank you. Johnny Goff? Aye. Robert Hall? Aye. Lisa Hayes? Lisa Hayes? Not present. John Isaac? Aye. Theodore James? Aye. Uh, Keisha Martin? Keisha Martin? Not to talk. Aye. Aye. You there? I'm oh, here. Hi, Keisha. Okay. Lucille Martin. Lucille Martin, are you still here? Did we see Lucille? Not present. I'm marking her not present. She's not answering me. Mike? Aye. Carmen Ortiz? Aye. Thanks, Carmen. Queen Pananiagua? Uh, she's excused. Absent. She's excused? Yes, she reached out to me. Anthony Reed? Aye. Sherry Samuels? Aye. Paul Stricker? Aye. Benga Sabea? Aye. Luke Sabados? Aye. Deborah Torado? Aye. Deborah Walker? Aye. Ryan Walters? Ryan Walters? Not present. Estea Yemma? Aye. Beatrice Coronel? Aye. Uh, is Ivan Boris back or is he there or what? Yeah, I saw his hand was raised. Ivan? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, abstain. You abstaining? Yes. The eyes have it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Benitez. Now we're moving on to the financial report. Ms. Talene. Good evening. Salutations and blessings. Uh, nothing has changed since last month. We are still at 2625. Um, my information is in the chat. And if there's anything you need to ask, please feel free to contact me. Please stay safe, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you, Talene. Now we're great. moving on to the- And it was a great presentation. Great presentation, Paul, if you're still on here. I think he left, but we're, we're going to have him back. Um, now we're moving on to the next item in our agenda, which is committee reports. First up, we have land use. Yes, good evening, everybody. On April 10th, we had a, a land use hearing on the application from 222nd Street uh, Realty for a continuance of their various to op operate their repair shop there. At the hearing, we didn't, uh, we heard nothing but opposition to it. And uh, we uh, also, 
We found out the lawyer told us that he had two violations from his building's department. And actually, according to Alfredo, he has six. So, and he has never responded to any violation that he got in his business. Also, he, he clutters up the streets and he parks illegally all over on the sidewalks, on crosswalks and so forth. The day we had the hearing, uh, Ursula passed the, passed the area and saw that he painted the lines and everything like he was asked to do. But, the, uh, but the, there was nobody that spoke for him. And so, uh, and everybody who spoke, spoke uh, was opposed. So the land use committee took a vote to deny his application for a continued variance. And I asked the board to please uh, uh, approve the land use uh, recommendation that it's not, not, not uh, the land uses report. And after the report is approved, I will uh, give you a little more information on what happened at that meeting. So can I have a motion? Do we have a second? Seconded. Denise Bond seconding. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, the next move would be normally to vote in favor of the, uh, of the land use committee's uh, recommendation. But before I tell you, uh, before we vote on it, I'd like to explain to you what happened. Everybody there spoke against the, the continual variance because the guy is definitely not a good neighbor. He has loud parties there. He uh, four seven precinct had issues with him. He had six outstanding violations, which he never attended to. And also, instead of coming to the community board like it was supposed to, he went right to. Uh, BSA for the continuous of the variance. Now, I, I, I'll give them a little break on that because we were in, a, in this coronavirus deal, but uh, COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it. But he still had to come. The board was still here and active, mm -hmm. even though we were virtually, well, like we are tonight, we were active board. And he never, he tried to go around the board because he knew that he was giving the neighbor, neighbors problems. So he, uh, it took three requests for them to attend a meeting on this uh, continued zoning. His legal representation was a lawyer from New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, who has never been into New York or at that site as far as I know. And after we denied the variance continuation, he wrote a nasty letter to the board. He said the, he couldn't believe all these people spoke out about him having to be, a, be being a bad neighbor and that he knows only of two violations, not of six. But, uh, one of our land use committee members checked it out and he had six violations, totaling $24,000 that he has failed to answer and still has failed to answer up to today. And the last time we gave him a variance, he had the same issues. He, he had a dirty site. He did this, he did that. He promised to do everything. So he took him at his word and he went right back to doing what he was doing. And we got a letter from his lawyer saying the board is a racist board because we did not approve his application. He said the board is nothing but a bunch of racists. And he took exception to one, one member who, who took him to task about how can he represent somebody that he doesn't even know or what they're doing. And this guy has been bad news now going on, I guess, 
well, when he renewed it, he bought the place in 1960, and he had to get the variance then. And he, every time we give him a variance, he promises to clean up his shop, his shop. But he doesn't do that. And I will tell you also, a local ele- elected official <coughs> in our community sent a letter to the uh, Board of Standards and Appeals telling them that he's against him getting the extension on his variance because he is not a good neighbor to the community because his community hardship he has loud, a lot of loud parties on his property and barbecues going into early morning hours when people have to get up the next morning to go to work and they disturb they can't sleep so i'm asking the full board to vote in favor of our recommendation not to renew his permit, a variance permit at this at this location because he, he, he'll go back to doing what he did the last two times we approved it. So the man is not at his word ever. So I just ask the board to support the land use committee and its efforts to to keep him from getting the renewal of his variance, which is by by the way is two years past due, three years past due. So I I, I need a motion from the board to accept the report of the. Well, you did accept the report already. No, to, we did. Uh, no, yeah, we did. We did it. take. A, I, I asked. We had a first and second for it to accept the report of the uh, nominating committee. Now I'm asking for a letter to support the decision of the nominating committee. That's yeah, what I'm asking land for. Use. Land use. Can I have a motion? I make a motion. Second. Okay. Can, can you take a roll count? Uh, roll call count, please. Uh, mm-hmm. First, can I know who made the motion? This is Michelle. Anthony Reed. Excuse me. Excuse me. I have one question. I heard something about nominating committee. No, it's the land use. Yeah, this is this is land use. Oh, okay. I just wanted to be clear because you said nominating committee. That's why. Yes, you did. And the second was um figure what the second was it Alfredo? Who was the second? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take a roll call, please. Okay. Um Judith Benitez, aye. Denise Bond, aye. Ivan Boris. Aye. Carla Basati. Aye. Michelle Bromfield. Aye. Victor Brown. Aye. Deacon Brown. Aye. Norbert Bryan. Norbert Bryan. Not present. Desiree Campbell. Desiree Campbell. Aye. Sadie Campbell. Robert Brent, present. Who's that? Robert Brian. Sorry about that. Are you saying aye or nay? Aye, aye. Sadie Campbell. Sadie. Is Sadie still here? I, I, I for Sadie. Oh, thank you, Sadie. Claude. I. Chris Devone. Not present. Colleen Dickerson. I. Kevin Eichelberger. Not present. Alfredo Figueroa. Johnny Goff. Aye. We couldn't hear you. Robert Hall. Aye. 
Lisa Hayes, not present. John Isaac. Aye. Theodore James. Aye. Keisha Martin. Aye. Lucille Martin. Not present. Clinton Mike. Clinton Mike. Aye. Carmen Ortiz. Aye. Anthony Reed. Aye. Sherry Samuels. Aye. Paul Stricker. Aye. Benga. Uh, aye. Thank you. Aye, thank you. Luke Zapados. Aye. Deborah Torado. Aye. Deborah Walker. Aye. Ryan Walters. Not present. Esther Yemma. Aye. Beatrice Coronel. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you. I want to thank everybody on the board. Thank you, Carl. Now we're moving on to the next uh, committee report, housing. Mr. Robert Hall. Um, yes, the, uh, on the 23rd of March, uh, the gentleman came before us to ask whether we would be interested in allowing um, a lot of uh, factories to have their variance changed so that they could have affordable housing. So we had that, the housing committee had that meeting and it was decided um, that we would like to entertain a letter to approve the fact that the variance should be changed for these factories to be able to now have affordable housing. But to make a long story short, the reason we're going along with this program is in the best interest of the borough of Manhattan because it does not really affect directly the community board uh, community, to make a long story short. So we decided to go along with that. And I believe Madam Chair said it didn't help Kathy Hochul <laughs> with the uh, budget. But in any event, uh, we decided to go forward. But it's just a letter of support. But that letter does not affect Community Board 12 as far as our particular units and our community is concerned. So that's basically it. I can't remember the gentleman's name and Madam Chair, maybe you can uh, mention it. John Sanchez from Fiber. There, there you go. Okay. So um, I don't know, do we, do we need a motion or should we just go forward with the letter? Um, well, we do have a question. Luke, yeah. is it related to this? Yeah, I just wanted to make a uh, point of clarification that I think the John Sanchez was talking about office to residential conversions rather than uh, factory to. I, I stand corrected. You're right, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Sabados. You, you're absolutely correct. All right. But in any effect, it did not really upset uh, our community board district to make a long story short. And I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank everybody that took part. All right, even Mr. Reed and 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 uh, my friend there on the uh, <laughs> Department of Buildings. <laughs> All right, I, I want to thank everybody's input. So, and that's that's you basically have, it. You have one more question, Anthony. Is your hand raised? Yes, yes, my my hand is raised. I I just wanted to ask you. You said that it didn't have anything to do. With with us, but it did have something to do in Manhattan. Am I correct? Well, to make a long story short, the the entire idea was really to kind of assist a lot of the uh, buildings in Manhattan <laughs> for the most part. Re that's, the reason that's the way it was presented to us. All right. The reason why I asked you that because. I, I, I want to know if we reached out to any of the boards in Manhattan and see what they thought about it, because if, if it doesn't affect us, it might affect them. And if we give a letter, okay, and it, 
and it and it affects them in a negative way. I don't want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Oh, I I agree with you. No, it was it was on a positive nature, and uh, it seemed as if a lot of other boards were going along with that program, because uh, afford housing affordability is hurting everyone everywhere. To make a long story short, and that was the idea. And I mentioned Manhattan because that's centrally where these, the that's where the idea is is hurting the most. But we're 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 okay. We're okay. Make a long story short. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I also like to mention, Robert, if you permit me to, is sure. that most of the office buildings that would be converted has to be built before 1960 because. The design of the buildings changed in 1960, which makes them almost impossible to convert to housing at a reasonable cost. Prior to that, uh, 1960, the buildings that were built can easily be converted to uh, from office building to apartments. That was mentioned that year. You're, you're absolutely right, Carl. You're absolutely right. Um, I just wanted to cut to the chase because I know uh, that was really the bottom line. And I wanted to make sure that um, board 12 was not directly affected. And it is, it hasn't been. So that that's basically it. Well, I'll make a motion that we accept the report of the housing committee. Second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We also are, are we also having a motion in reference to the letter of support? I need a motion for that. Uh, so moved. Second. Who's seconding it? Ivan Borens. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all participants. I'm getting ready to call the roll. No, so um, I have a question. So this statement of recommendation will say what? Just for my own clarity. Um, Madam Chair, you have the letter. So that we, no, I, that we support. It, it basically states that we we support the conversion of office buildings to apartment buildings. And this will be mostly in the financial district, by the way. Right, so that's my question. Being from Community Board 12, knowing that it will not affect the Bronx, I'm saying that will the letter say state that for clarity for us, for our own protection, since it will not affect us in the Bronx? I think that goes with what Anthony Reed's concern is. That's correct. It does state that. And also Community Board one voted in favor of it, by the way, which is the... Uh, the community board that represents the financial district. Great. Can we move forward? Yeah, let's take a roll call. Or just say if anybody's opposed. I mean, yeah. Right. It's quicker. Is anybody opposed? Yeah. Any opposed? Yeah. I'll abstain, Michelle Bromfield. I abstain as well, Deborah Walker. Um, Denise Bond, abstain. And it was um, Deborah Walker? Correct. Thank you. Anyone else abstaining? Anyone recusing themselves from this? Do I have a motion of yes? Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you all. Aye. 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 Great. Now we're moving on to the next committee report, Health and Human Services. Clinton. Oh, sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So on April 5th, 2023, a meeting was held of the Community Board 12 Health and Human Services. Uh, the meeting was chaired by myself at the time. At this time, the committee is without a chairperson. The meeting was not attended by any of the uh, Health and 
Human Health Services Committee members. Meeting commenced at 7.06 p.m. on April 5th. The agenda, on the agenda was the proposed individualized residential alternative home, IRA, sponsored by Daybreak Independent Services of 4244 Verio Avenue, Bronx, New York. Representing Daybreak was Vilas Loban, the president and CEO of Daybreak. Daybreak Ind Independent Services pre presented their case for an IRA, Individualized Residential Alternative Home. Um, they're proposed, proposing a residence, oh, I, believe, I believe I said the address wrong before, it's 4244 Vireo Avenue for six young adults ages 18 to 21 with 24 hour daily oversight and guidance with independent living skills, recreation and transportation while providing employment opportunities for members of the community. Presented to the community at the meeting time were signatures of various members of the community who support the residents in the district. Daybreak is asking for a letter of support from the community board for this project. One member of our community board expressed their support for the residents as they live in the direct community in which the residents would be in and noted the work that they are currently doing in the community with their current consumers is impressive from what has been seen. There was no quorum for the community for this committee meeting and this letter of support cannot be voted on at the time. That's it. But the full board can vote on it. Yes. So they would like a letter of support from community board 12 for their uh, IRA, which I, again, I said includes uh, six individuals aged 18 to 21. It's right on the same block as their uh, Daybreak Independent Services offices. As a person that lives nearby, I make a motion that we give them a letter of support. Do we have a second? A second, Anthony. Thank you. So, we'll take a question? Any anyone? Call the question. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Ready to vote. No, ask if anybody's against it. We can go that way. Let me ask. Um, are there anyone abstaining? No abstentions? Yes, one, Deborah Walker. Anyone else? Any recusals? Yes, myself. I'll be recusing myself. And the rest. Um, I would like to abstain, Deborah Torado. Deborah Torado? Okay, thank you. The rest, are uh, we all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to Parks and Recreation, Ms. Bond. Hi, good evening all. Um, just as a point of clarification, um, Madam Chair, I need to go over my committee report in, in with summarizing what took place at the meeting and then go into what we need to vote on, yes? Yeah, very briefly, just okay. right what was under discussion, the PEP Command Center at Van Cortland Park and what the committee yeah. voted on, which was yes, I believe. Right, and but so no, it also says committee letter. report, so I just wanted to clarify, so I should give the committee report information. Oh, summary of what happened, right? What we're, what we're voting okay. on today. All right. A brief one, and then we will take a vote on that, that okay. to accept the report. All right. So the committee report, the um, Parks and Rec um, for Community Board 12 had a meeting on April 11th at 7 p.m. Um, just the brief overview of what took place during the meeting. We revised the mission statement. We talked about the PEP uh, command for Van Cortland Park, and that is what we're going to be voting on tonight. And I'll give more information about that in a minute. We also got more information about the Van Cortland Park um, pedestrian bridge. Ms. Bond, we're just talking about the PEP command center. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So the PEP command, um, there was a letter drafted by community board eight, the parks department. And what the committee voted on was to send a letter of support to go along with the community board eight. Um, Ms. Bromf Ms. Bromfield made the motion. It was seconded by Mr. Boris and the uh, um, the community, the committee rather, um, voted unanimous unanimously in um, acceptance of this. Uh, so what we have in here is that their community board eight has sent a letter requesting that there be a new PEP command center open at Van Cortland Park because the nearest one to uh, Van Cortland Park now is located in Pelham Bay Park. And so the response time for the PEP uh, officers is would take some time as opposed to having one right in Van Cortland Park, which would be a benefit to the community. So that is what we need to um, vote on is that letter of support. And I have a motion for that, please. So can we get a motion? I'm sorry, a motion to accept the report. I, I make the motion to accept the report. Second that. Carl did a motion and Ted James seconded. Okay, perfect. Question? I'm sorry? Is there a question? Any questions? Are we ready to Can vote? We report with you? Yes, okay. we're ready to vote, Ms. Benitez. Okay. Uh, are there any abstentions to this? Any recusals? Hi, this is Luke. I recuse myself. Um, anyone else? Are we all in favor? Um, aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you. Aye. Um, Beatrice, there's a question in the chat from uh, Will Consuerga. Yeah, but only board members can ask questions. I think this is about, he wants to know if a vote was held. I think that's what the uh the, the auto repair place on two twenty second. Yeah, it was held. He's asking a question in the chat. Okay, let's finish with this. Thank you, Clint. Okay. Um, okay, so now um Ms. Denise Bond, you'll make a motion for the letter of support. I make the motion or someone else has to make the motion. Yeah, that's what's next. I mean I move to make a motion to uh letter of support. For the pep center. Thank you. We need a second. Mm -hmm. Anthony, second. Thank you. Um, Luke, you you were choosing it. That's and, right. Am I'm correct? Okay. Right. Thank you. Everyone else is saying aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Aye. Thank you, board members. <coughs> okay, um, yes, William, we did, the vote was held to answer your question. Okay, uh, my apologies. My next door neighbor is an elderly man and he fell down. He, he hurt his leg just now. And so I was outside helping him. Uh, I heard him yelling and so I didn't get a chance to be in here. I, I knew the, the hearing was going on, but I didn't get a chance to walk back in. So my apologies, I, I'm, I, I'm not meaning to guess what the vote was, but I do want to uh, say that my client um, is making efforts to uh, meet the uh, requests of the BSA and um, that they are, you know, attempting to abide by that. They have made some changes already, but um, obviously I, I, I think I know the, the opinion of the community board, uh, at least the land board or the land committee I know that what their opinion was, and so um, if it went uh, similar to that vote, then um, that's okay. My my client is uh, working diligently to meet all the conditions that the BSA is placing on him and his business, and uh, attempting to become a better neighbor to the uh, 
the community board 12. Yeah, that's what he said the last time. Denise Bond, your hand is up. Yes. Um, just to Mr. Consuego, I think that perhaps instead of writing the letter that you did in reference to the meeting that was held at the land use committee, maybe if your client had come with a different posture, then it, things could have gone a little bit smoother. But definitely, uh, you're, you are right that it went just the way you anticipated. That's all, just a comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Bonds. Okay, so that concludes our committee reports. We're moving on to the next item of the agenda, which is new business. As you all know, we have elections coming up. I'm and sorry, so... I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you real quick? Go ahead. If I'm not mistaken, if you're going to recuse yourself, Luke and Judith, I think you have to give a reason why. I know the reason, but for the record, you have to give a reason why, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're right. Yes, you're right, Ursula. You're right. Sure. And that's, and that's my mistake. Um, Luke, state what, what your recusal is for. Yes, uh, this is for the Parks Committee uh, uh, letter. This is because I'm employed by Bronx Community Board 8. So Thank it would be a conflict. Thanks. Okay. And for me, it's because and the reason why I recused in reference to the IRA uh, is because I'm also part of a, a rising ground which is similar or, well, we have an extension of that program with us. So that is why I'm recusing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks, Earth. Now we're moving on to new business. As you all know, um, our board officers elections are coming up. And so we need to formulate now a committee. An elections committee. So we need nominations from the floor. Five people. For the committee? Yeah, for the committee. The committee has to have five people. Okay. Do we have any volunteers? We take, we, we take well, we, they have to be nominated from the floor. So a board member can nominate someone from the floor. That's from correct. Floor. Okay. I know. Uh, in fact, I'm going to nom nominate De Denise Bonds. She doesn't have to accept, but you know, I'm, I'm nominating her. <laughs> I believe I'm not allowed to, so it's all on you, board members. Denise, are you willing? Oh, oh, sorry. I didn't know if that was my time to reply. Um, I've yes. done it for a few years now. Let, you know, I think someone else should give it a try. We have some new members. Some other people should jump right in and get a part of the pro be a part of that process. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Stricker. You're welcome. I have a nomination. Go for it. Alfredo Figueroa. Alfredo, do you accept? Accept. Sorry. Accept what? Do you accept to, um, we're right now formulating a committee for the elections, officers elections coming up, and we need a five member committee for this. Okay. Five. Do you accept? To do what? What, what, what y'all want me to do? Be on the nominating committee. Nominating committee <laughs> for elections that are coming up. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we got one yes, I guess. Plus, anybody else have uh, recommend anybody? I nominate Luke Zabatos. I accept. Thank you. Um, Luke, do you want to nominate someone else? We'll keep the ball rolling that way. Sure, I nominate Benga. Benga, do you accept? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the nomination. I, I, I accept. I accept. Thank Benga, you. can you nominate someone else? Oh, wow. Uh, let me see. It's, uh... We have a lot of new members. Oh, new members. There's too many gentlemen. I'm looking at Ms. Sherry, Sherry Samuels. 
Okay. Dr. I, I Sherry, know, Sherry. I, Sherry. Okay. Sherry. Okay. I accept. Dr. Sherry. Okay. No, Sherry. I accept. And I recommend. I recommend Clinton Mac. Clinton. <laughs> thank you, but no, thank you. I've done it. <laughs> I've done it three times myself. Somebody else. Sherry, somebody. can you? Sherry, can you nominate know, someone else? Um, Sherry. Yeah, I nominate. Um, John Isaac. He, he's not. He's a. He's on the executive board. He can't. Yeah, he um, can't. He's a vice. He can't nominate. Okay. Um, I nominate Deborah Walker. Deborah Walker, do you accept? No, I decline. Thank you very much. We're looking at Mr. Anthony Reed. I nominate Anthony Reed. I accept. Okay. Beautiful. So we have five. Committee members, we have Alfredo, we have Luke, we have Benga, we have Sherry, and we have Anthony. Right. And now the five of them will meet and see who's the chair of the committee will be. That's up to them. Okay. So between the five of you, you will nominate the chair of that committee. We need to move fast, right? Oh, um, no, you don't have to do it before the board. They can do it. In fact, they're a committee. They can choose their chair when they meet. Right. right. And so, Ursula, do they need to schedule something with you for WebEx? It's a committee meeting, so they have to schedule. Right. Ursula, yeah. are you with us? They do. They do. Okay. They, they, can, okay. they can contact her or she can contact them. Right. So the following step, uh, maybe Alfredo, you can take charge of that, connecting with Ursula to schedule a, a committee meeting for you guys. And so I'm new to this. Um, Ms. Benitez or Carl, can you walk us through what the next steps are? Because I believe next month, then- well, next, next month, which is May, the, they will recommend, that they will come up with a, a, a nomination of, for each position. And at that time, since we don't want to hold this thing over to the summer, at that time, if there's any nominations from the floor that can be brought up for each office that's a, you know that's up for grabs or you know renewal or whatever you want to call it. So at that meeting, we'll have the final decision. If if there's no nominations from the floor, the, the, the five nominee uh, the five uh, the the nominating committee, whoever they recommended, will be uh, voted upon in June. If there's no uh, conflict, if there, if there's two people for the chair, two people for the vice chair, well then, what will happen during the month of uh, of May or uh, May into June will be that uh, votes uh, nom uh, votes will go out to everybody by email and they will check off on who they're voting for. But if Joe Schmo for second vice chair and Harry Burt for second vice chair, well, if you want Harry Burt, well, he'll be, you know, you check his name. If you want Joe Schmo, you check his name. And then in June, we will have the final count. And who who's the new executive board? Great. Uh, Luke, you have a question. Thank you, Carl. Thanks so much, Carl. Uh, I just wondered if all of the officers are seeking renomination, or is that something I, we can find out later? Well, you, could, you what you can do after you, you know, have you, you as as your as a committee, you can check with each one if they're considered to run again. And All right. And if they are, then they then they become part of the nominating committee that they, they, they want to run. You can have two or three people running for the same position, but they have to be presented in May. Great. Any questions before we wrap up? It's nine forty-eight. I don't want to keep you any longer. Well, you know, this was a long meeting, Beatrice, but it was worth it. Thank you. Um, uh, chair, I would like to, I mean, not chair, yeah, president, chair, 
I'd like to make an announcement. Yes. Is this Ms. Okay. Gold? Yes. Um, the YMCA, the new Y, uh, 1250 um, Laconia Avenue, have partnered up with SAFER and another organization to have a Mother Day cocktail brunch, Bits and Bites, on Mother's Day, which is the 14th of May, from 1230 to 3. I'll send a flyer to Ursula, but I wanted to make sure they asked me to do the announcement at the, at the board this, tonight. May 14th, which is Mother's Day, they are having a cocktail brunch. The YMCA and my group and another group, they're going to be giving out, uh, they're having dinner, lunch, whatever you want to call it, with the rose and a cup of apple cider, a uh, glass of apple cider. Thank All you, Ms. Welcome, Scott. Including children. And this Great. is at the Y, this is at the Y, Johnny? Yes, it is, Carl. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, dear. Uh, Ms. Connell, I, I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Ted. Yes, yeah, so earlier Clinton reported that um, his committee had no chair and also there was no quorum. Um, is this a new committee? And um, I, I don't know if I got a notice for this um, meeting, but he also said that there were no members present for that committee. Can you enlighten us on that? Yes, that committee currently does not have a chair. It was Mr. Carl Lanzana that used to chair that committee. And committee members did not show up. Was there a notice that was sent out for that meeting? Yes, yeah. Ursula sent out the notice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Denise, do you have your hands up? I do. I I fail. Oh wait, sorry. I failed to mention also when I uh, was my turn to speak about the committee report that Jamba Gardens, um, the gardens that the community board has supported. Um, is having their first planting event on May 6 from 12 to 4. Um, the flyer has been sent um, to Ursula and I believe she has sent that out. So please come out and support if at all possible. Thank you. Uh, Talene? Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to let everybody know that the applications for the summer rising program is very low in District 11. So, Ursula will receive a flyer tomorrow and get it out to all the board members. And you can please, please share it. Thank you, Talleen. Alfredo? Um, I just want to see, um, I think I saw Toba's name here. Is Toba, are you still here? Toba? Toba? Could have sworn I saw you, but um, just want to uh, announcement that we have a new commanding officer in the 47th precinct. Um, yeah, I don't got the new. I'll I'll definitely invite him to our next full board meeting so he can introduce himself. Uh, want to bring put that out there. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, okay. On the ed Anyone else? Go ahead. I'm sorry. On the ed committee. Uh, I mentioned to Ms. Dixon that um, District 11 Super Deputy Superintendent Mr. Russo is on leave, and they have an interim acting um, Deputy Superintendent, uh, and uh, he invited her to the board meeting in the month of May. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right, everyone. Why well, don't want to keep? Oh wait. Robert Hall, do you have your hands up? Yeah, I'll, I'll yield. I'll yield. I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll yield. That, that's okay. Thank you. All right, Thank everyone. You, Thank you. Thank you. I so can I make much. a motion that we close the meeting? Yes. I second. I second. All in favor? Thank you so much for your patience. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Great okay. meeting, God, God bless you, so Great all. job. Great job. Happy Mother's Day. Well, and remember, there's a lot of committee meetings coming up. Please, please participate. That is your time.
to speak at length. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Okay. Good, good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye good, bye. Night. good night. Oh, wait. And the meeting, we're closing the meeting the out. Sorry. Through? We're closing the meeting out at 9.54 p.m. Clinton, it's cold in here, man. Oh, yeah? Sorry yeah. to hear that. <laughs> go New York, go We're coming, coming for the go. next. We're coming for the next, baby. Go New York, go. Go, go, go New York, go New York, go. <laughs> go. All right, everyone. Good night. I'm shutting good down. Night. Yeah, Atlanta. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>